We're going to give it a couple of minutes before we start, since people are just kind of signing on right and left now. We're just waking up. Hey. <laughs> I had to get out and shovel this morning. Had a couple inches. Oh, well, good for you. We didn't get anything. It's a beautiful day again, so. We well, kinda... it's going to turn out nice. Always warms up to about 30 degrees, about 2 o'clock. That's what we love about Colorado, right? Yeah. The absolute beauty of it. One more minute. Okay, we've got about 46 people signed on so far, so it'll keep going up. Uh, so we we'll might as well get started. Um, introductions. I'm Vince Rogalski, and I'm chairman of the stack. I'm also chairman of the Gunnison Valley Transportation Planning Region. Uh, Dr. Cog. Good morning, Nicholas Williams, uh, representing the Dr. Cog region. Morning. Um, Eastern TPR. Uh, this is Chris Richardson representing Eastern TPR. Okay, um, Central Front Range. Hey, it's Dwayne McFall, Central Front Range Chair, and Dick Elsner, Vice Chair, is on here also. Okay, um, Grand Valley. Good morning, uh, Rachel Peterson, Grand Valley MPO. Okay, uh, Gunnison Valley. I think uh, the alternate is on, so go ahead, Roger. Yes, good morning, everyone. Roger Ash, uh, Montrose County Commissioner and Gunnison Valley TPR. Thank you. Okay, Inner Mountain. Yeah, it's uh, Brian Pettit with the Inner Mountain Transportation Planning Region. Okay, front, upper, excuse me, North Front Range. Morning, uh, Vince, and uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Scott James, Chair, Upper Front Range Transportation. I'm sorry. Huh, that's not, that was the old one. North Front Range Metropolitan Planning Organization. I'm also uh, joined by uh, Suzette Millett and Becky Carrasco with the said region. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks, Scott. <clears throat> Northwest. Hi, Heather Sloop with Northwest TPR. Okay, Pikes Peak. Holly Williams, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, as well as today we have Danelle Miller, um, our transportation planner, instead of John Leah Saros. So thank okay. you. Okay, Pueblo area. Good morning, this is Eva Costleon, MPO manager. Not sure if Commissioner Swearingen is on yet, but I think he will be attending. Thank you. Okay, uh, San Luis Valley. Good morning, Keith Baker, San Luis Valley TPR and Chaffee County Commissioner. And we also have Tony Cady and Kevin Curry from Region 5 with us. Oh, good. Morning. Morning. Uh, South Central. John Galusha, we're from County Commissioner and South Central TPR. Southeast. Ron Cook, Pars County Commissioner. Uh, Southwest. Southwest. Upper Front Range. Commissioner Kevin Ross, Weld County here for the uh, Upper Front Range. Okay, uh, Southern Ute.
Ute Mountain. FHWA. FTA. Hi, good morning. Kristen Kenyon, Federal hey. Transit. Hi, thank hey, good morning. Kristen, morning. Okay, did I miss anybody? I think we got everybody except somebody from the Southwest. Southwest? Okay, first item on the agenda is the approval of December meeting minutes. Thought we should have the February minutes. Move to approve, Holly Williams. Okay, so we're talking about the February minutes that are attached to your packet. Is there a second? Second, Nicholas Williams. Okay, are there any uh, corrections or additions? Hearing none, are there, is there anyone who disagrees with approving the minutes for February 2nd stack meeting? Hearing none, we'll consider them approved. Herman. Good morning, Vince. Good morning, Stack. Hope everybody's doing good today. Uh, just a quick update. Um, uh, I'll just say Shoshana and our um, comms director, Matt Enzio, are in D.C. this week as part of our annual AASHTO, our state organizations fly in and meeting with our uh, members of our congressional delegation. So. I uh, hope they're having a good trip. Uh, also, um, this week was our deadline for submitting raise grants, as probably a lot of you know as well. Um, we had a strong partnership with our locals and that we know of, at least on our state highways, we had seven grants that were submitted. So we're excited about that and just wanted to, to thank um, uh, Hannah on, on our policy office staff and Alejandra and the Darius's staff and, and all of the folks in the regions that worked so hard to get, get grants together. So we're excited about that. Uh, hopefully somebody in Colorado will be successful with some raise grants this year. Um, <clears throat> I'll also just give you a fill in on what we're planning for Transportation Commission here in a couple weeks. Um, uh, starting off with a joint workshop with our- And, with and all of the, the folks in the regions that worked so hard to get, get grants that was strange. I was hearing myself yeah. back. <laughs> um, uh, but we've got a, a, a joint workshop with CTIO uh, on the TIFIA loans. So up north with segments uh, six, seven, and eight, and, and getting segment five into that, we're making progress. And that results in some actions that will be necessary both by the Transportation Commission and the CTIO. So we're uh, wading into that in March. Um, Jeff is going to ask for adoption of our uh, budget for 23-24, and I think he's presenting that to you all today as well. Uh, we think that we'll get this done in time, but we're, we've got a bus rapid transit in the, in the metro area presentation. As Dr. Cog knows, uh, their plan and CDOT's 10-year plan has a designated amount of funds for, uh, for bus rapid transit doesn't list in our 10-year plan what projects we're actually considering. It just says kind of placeholder 10-year plan with some dollars in it. So uh, Jessica and Angie are going to talk about uh, um, Federal Boulevard, Colorado Boulevard, a couple other corridors, Colfax, maybe 270, um, and then an update on I think 119 that's in Region 4 that's, that's uh, a little further along than the rest of those corridors. So we're going to uh, fill in the commission and give them an idea of what uh, uh, where we think those those ten year plan dollars are going to be going, you're going to hear about uh, right away um, or uh, fiber from our fiber team. Uh, 
commission has gotten a presentation like that. And also this month, they're going to be um, talking about our fee-based proposal for access to our right-of-way. So that'll be a big step in the right direction to make things a lot easier for folks that are trying to access our right-of-way for fiber. Um, we've got a safety update. We have four, really four units at, at CDOT that are that have a lot of focus on safety. Uh, our traffic engineering folks, our Office of Transportation Safety folks that do a lot of the education and enforcement grants, uh, our comms office for our media campaigns, and then our uh, maintenance and operations division with incident management. So they're all going to come together for a presentation to the commission. No action item, but just an update on what we're doing in each of those four areas for safety. If that's something that Stack is interested in as well, we can we can have them make that presentation um, to this group as well at some point. I think it'll be a good overview education on the, the different things that we do when it comes to safety. A couple committee meetings, uh, Small Business Diversity Committee and Audit Committee are meeting. Um, and that's, I think that's about it. That's the highlights. I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, Vince, uh, thankfully, I think a little more quiet the last couple of weeks. <laughs> um, anybody have questions for Herman? Okay, uh, Transportation Commission update on their meeting they had um, in February. Um, that was uh, February 15 and 16. And we talked about the budget and we're, we have uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, recommend a decision on the budget here when we talk about it at our meeting. A uh, couple of things that they talked about is um, there was a concern about emergency repairs and contingencies, especially for the snow this year, since they've already drawn 1.8 million of the $10 million contingency fund for ice and snow. Uh, and another 5.5 has been requested for, uh, for this year. And so there are things there that, that are we got the budget right? Uh, uh, are we going to go up above what we have now for this year's budget? Um, one of the other things is spending more money on avalanche control this year, uh, but only slightly more than usual. Well, we've had a lot of avalanches with a lot of snow, and so we're going to have to spend some more taking care of that stuff. Um, the Office of Innovative Mobility, OIM, um, has talked about redoing how they request money for projects and what they're going to do um, if they change their project plan drastically, they'll come to the TC Commission for approval and the TC will um, uh, decide how they want to do stu uh, stuff there, uh, though the 10-year plan and other funding sources. Okay, so um, Herman talked about the um, poor pavement. Uh, the basic idea in the poor pavement for the interstates is if you don't have the interstate up to date and you have to have less than 5% poor, less than 5% poor, they will direct the money that they give us away from the projects that we're funding and direct it to repair the interstate. And we'll, we'll have a better uh, understanding of what that is when the presentation is put together. Um, Herman also mentioned something about uh, the fiber program. And the, in, the presentation they had at the Transportation Commission meeting was really excellent. And Allie, um, did a, an outstanding job in pre presentation. And so I hope you guys enjoy it too and I have a lot of questions uh, because uh, broadband and fiber affect all of us every day. Um, let's see. Um, I think that's pretty much it. All of the... Um, um, things on the regular meeting, which happened on Thursday, all the items presented and resolutions were approved. Any questions?
Okay, moving on. Um, TPR representative uh, reports. Let's go with Dr. Cog. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so yes, the Dr. Cog board met in February. Uh, one thing celebrated there is uh, winter work to bike, no, winter bike to work day. Uh, estimated about 4,200 folks participated uh, throughout our region uh, with about 53 different stations where uh, folks could rest, refuel, relax. And since it was February, uh, warm up, with a nice cup of coffee. Uh, on there uh, at our board meeting made some uh, committee assignments, including stack and uh, I'm going to be able to hang out with you guys for another year, uh, and I will also be joined by uh, Commissioner George Teal of Douglas County, one of my fe fellow directors on the Dr. Cog board. I do believe he is in the audience today, uh, and he will be serving as alternate, keeping me honest. Uh, board Thanks, also. Matt. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Absolutely, George. <laughs> Glad to have you. Uh, board also adopted our regional transportation operations and technology strategic plan. Uh, I think that will uh, align with uh, one of our topics today on fiber, but really the purpose of that plan is to make sure that the technology deployment that our region is using is connected, collaborative, both with our local governments and certainly with CDOT uh, on there. And then finally, we set uh, federal transportation performance measures for safety, pavement and bridge condition, as well as travel reliability uh, all done in partnership with CDOT. End of report. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Nicholas? Okay, Central Front Range. Thank you, Vince. This is uh, Dick. Let me get that thing out of the way. Uh, this is Dick Elsner, Front, Central Front Range. Starting to uh, look at getting into some building going on. Uh, Fair Play will be starting in... Uh, probably a month, month and a half with some preliminary work. So if you're driving uh, along 285 this summer, next fall, winter, and the following summer, uh, fair play is going to be an issue. It's a rather large project with the bridge going on. I've got a couple of things going on Highway 24, so we'll have the same issue there. Uh, during the summer, we've got bridge replacements that are happening there. Hopefully the um, Chain up station on nine north of uh, Fair Play will be in uh, construction this year, and then they'll be finishing off the one on uh, 285, just uh, shy of Kenosha on the east side. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Hickey for showing up. We had a uh, a town hall on transportation in the Bailey area because of the uh, Crow Hill issue and and the trucks tipping over. It was really great to see her out there talking with everybody. Uh, trying to get people to understand that, yes, we're working on it. Uh, there will be a project, we hope, this summer on that, depending upon uh, where the bids come in. I mean, if they come in uh, ridiculously high, then we'll have to rethink it. But I think that's going to be fixed this summer. It's about all I got. Do you have anything, Dwayne? Oh, you covered it, Dick. Thank you. Okay, Eastern TPR. Morning. Um, haven't Morning. had it. Haven't had a uh, TPR meeting since the last stack, so nothing to report there. I mean, regionally, we've been dealing with uh, multiple multiple storms, not a lot of snow, but a lot of wind that's been closing state highways. Um, have had a lot of discussions um, internally just on closures and how they're rep represented on Colorado trips in some areas. Um, uh, the wrong gates on highways have been noted, and, um, so it's been causing some confusion amongst uh, local travelers as to exactly what town they can get to. And in some places, we've had some closures where roads have been clear, but um, that's something we'll continue to work. Um, I'll pass it on to Scott Weaver from Yuma, my co-chair. I think he may have something to add. No, the only thing I'd, I would add is um, we're facing some of the same stuff that um, the Western Slope is, is that what they normally face is um, the lack of people to fill the seats of plows. And, and that's one of our concerns out here. And I know we're probably on the downslope of the winter um, out here, but um, that's that's really all I have to add, Chris. And we do have a meeting coming up um, March 6th, so next Monday. So that'll be our Eastern TPR meeting, and we'll cover some of that there. And we actually have quite a few more people coming to the meeting. We've got our maintenance, um, regional maintenance um, 
manager coming. So we'll be able to visit with him and talk to him. So I think it'll be a good meeting, good productive meeting. So thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, uh, uh, Grand Valley. Good morning, Vince. Um, I'm Rachel Peterson. I'm the transportation planner with the Grand Valley MPO. I'm filling in right now for Dana, who is on maternity leave. Um, so she had a uh, happy baby boy um, this past February, mid-February or so. So we're really excited for her. Um, and then the, the big news updates from Grand Valley is Greyhound is no longer serving Grand Junction. Um, hopefully with the Mobility Hub coming back, we will um, get them back into our community. Um, and then the other point was that the Mobility Hub will, there's officially a site selected. Um, so we're looking forward to um, working together with Bustang and Greyhound and bringing our Grand Valley Transit system all together at one site. Um, and then we were happy to support CDOT's raise grant for Glenwood Canyon and Cottonwood Pass. Um, that's all I have, if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Okay, Gunnison Valley, and um, I'll do that one right now. Um, if you haven't been watching the uh, US 50 Little Blue Creek <clears throat> improvements, they haven't been working now this winter. Well, it's obvious. But they're going to start maybe sometime, maybe three weeks from now, um, and get the project going again. So the thing of it is, is if you really need to use Highway 50 later this month, you better check to see if there's any closures at the time. Right now, it's open to two-way traffic, but um, it may uh, come down to one-lane traffic with a delay. And uh, the last time we had that. There was 15 to 30 minute delays until the um, opposite lane was allowed to go. And then you wait, wait, and then you'd go your, your turn, so on, so on. There's still a lot of blasting to do, and they'll still have to repave everything. Now, optimistically, they uh, think they're going to be done mid-July. But everybody that I tell that to laughs. So... I think uh, we may be seeing more and more of that through the summer. Um, the, the TAP program is out now, so people are beginning to send in uh, applications. Remember, if you're sending in an application, you need to talk to the engineer within your region before you actually submit. Uh, and he's there to help you make sure you didn't miss anything on your application. Uh, another thing about uh, grant money, the initial MMOF funding uh, expires this June. And so um, if you haven't completed your project, you got to get on it or you got to apply for an extension. And um, that's an important issue that you need to take care of. Otherwise, you may lose your money. Um, Projects, as been mentioned before, will start probably start to begin uh, end of March, first part of April, uh, at least in the valleys, not necessarily on the high mountain peaks or the passes because there's still a lot of snow up there. Our next TPR meeting is going to be May 11th, and I think I'll ask our alternate, Roger Rash, to comment uh, on the projects he's got working. No, oh, thank you, Vince, and good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we're really proud. Um, we just got the official numbers for 2022, and Montrose Regional Airport took over the lead as the most traveled airport on the Western Slope. Um, we saw over 460,000 passengers last year, which surpassed uh, Grand Junction's airport, which uh, uh, we're really proud of that. Uh, we're offering services uh uh, pretty well nationwide out of Montrose now and people are finding it. Uh, the other good news is uh, we're entering the final phase of the uh, $37 million uh, terminal expansion and remodel. Um, we're looking at the completion date in early fall. Um, and that's all contingent upon materials as usual. We've had delays due to uh, getting all the project materials uh, and availability has been an issue. Um, you know, it will double the size of the airport terminal. Um, we're actually um, purchasing jet bridges 
we went ahead and approved that, and uh, those are being um, looked into right now to try to come up with a company that can come in and actually, there's a whole fitment process to adding uh, jet bridges. So we've got to find the right company to do that work and get those designed and get them uh, delivered to Montrose County and installed. So we're really excited about getting that uh, process done. Um, the the addition it improves our baggage handling. It improves our, our we all have a bar venue in the restaurant uh, in the in the uh, facility. Two restaurants, which are really super nice. They'll be um, we'll go out to add on those um, just as soon as they're done and uh, um, have a competitive bid for folks to come in and run those restaurant facilities. Um, what else? Um, it just a, a lot more space, especially on the security side, where people will be a lot more comfortable once they're done. Uh, the other issue, uh, things we're working on, uh, we're working on trying to get um, centralized um, drop-off center at the airport, uh, working with All Points Transit and uh, anybody else that wants to work with us to build um, a bus shelter type facility and we'll be looking at grants and stuff like that. That's part of that planning grant that we uh, uh, applied for and received uh, along with the traffic light in front of the uh, airport, which is much needed. Um, the only other project we have is the light south of town at Chapita and Highway 550. That's on hold through the winter. We had some uh, uh, delay in getting some of the parts for that to finish it up so those should be in here and that project will start up this spring and there'll be a minor delays getting those uh, uh lights installed down there and other than that we're just same old stuff we're we're plowing snow which is a good thing and uh, our our uh, forces are out there working hand in hand with cdot and the city and trying to keep our roads safe so thank you everyone and stay warm we got another month of this i hope <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Inner Mountain. Yes, thank you, Vince. Uh, just quickly, we did meet as a TPR. It's been two weeks ago now. Uh, Region 3 asked our group to support uh, two raised grants, one being East Vale Pass Wildlife Crossings and the other being a I-70 Corridor Resilience and Connectivity Improvement. Um, so we met because there was some controversy uh, about supporting these grants, and I wanted to make sure that we had a, a majority supporting uh, before, we, before we submitted letters. Uh, both were supported by the group. We did have a pretty rich discussion about both raise grants, and uh, I think I'm representing the group by saying there was some frustration with the process. Um, imagine that, that um, we... We wanted to make sure that what's being submitted for grants are actually prioritized in some way. And in this case, we as a TPR were not involved in prioritization. And, and you know, the, the reason is that you know, these grants come up and, and CDOT responds and puts their best thought in, in place and, and submits for a grant that they think is important. Um, but knowing that grants are going to come up and uh, we will have another grant uh, process happening, we could have a list of projects that have been prioritized for grant funding. And then we would have buy-off automatically by the TPR. And so I think from a process standpoint, that could be improved because uh, there were people in the group that, you know, while East Vale Pass Wildlife Crossing may be important, it may not be the most important thing in our TPR. And that was uh, discussed uh, at length. So at the end of the day, we did support, we did send letters in support of both uh, raise grants, but there was a lot of discussion and uh, frankly, frustration. So um, that's the update. And uh, Terry Parch, who was the co-chair for Stack, uh, moved away from Glenwood Springs and uh, is taking a job in, in uh, the private sector so I'll be looking for another co-chair for, uh, for our TPR. And that's it. Thank you. Um, North, let's see, North Front Range. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the February 2nd meeting, our planning council did meet and approve the uh, FY 2023 transport program of projects. 
Uh, the uh, 2019 through 2023 in North Front Range MPO target for safety performance measures, the NFR MPO's uh, PM2 pavement and bridge condition, and PM3 system performance measures, and the First Amendment to the FY 2022 through 2023 Unified Planning Work Program. So that means that evening I was unusually agreeable. Uh, we also uh, are in the process of updating our 10-year list of projects ahead of the adoption of our 2050 RTP, which we'll do in September. Uh, we meet tonight, uh, and uh, so it's transportation day for me. Thanks, Vince. Thank you. Uh, now, you weren't reporting for North Front Range, were you? Yes. You were. Did I go ahead of time? No, you, you did fine. Okay. I was thinking of the Upper Front Range. which Yeah, Kevin will do that in a sec. Okay. Um, Northwest. Um, oh, you're, you're muted. Okay, now, sorry. We, uh, I'm at headquarters. I'm sorry. I, I just flew in. So, um, uh, we're all screwed up here. Yeah, the sound system's not working. Turn off yours. It sounds like maybe both Heather and Kathleen have their microphones on at the same time, so you're getting echo back and forth. If you just use one of them on and the other one is completely yeah. muted, that might work. Turn yours on. I'm on. Can you hear me? I can, yeah, Kathleen's is on. There you are. Okay, so, hi. I'm down at headquarters because I just flew in. Um, we have not had a TPR meeting since our last meeting, but we did, um, uh, Grand County did submit a race grant, which was in full support throughout our uh, communities and our region. So we are very hopeful that that gets um, supported because it's very significant for our US 40 corridor, specifically in Grand County for Red Dirt Hill and the passing lanes through Crumling. Um, other than that, we are just trying to stay out of snow world and hoping for a smooth and steady melt so this water can actually use, be utilized in the right way. Thanks. Okay, um, Pike's Peak area. Holly. Yes, good morning. So um, we have not met and uh, today our Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments has breakfast uh, with the legislature. So they've been down there. Um, I know we, I think we approved our CDOT safety targets last month, but I was just going to give you some other things that were going on. Uh, in Colorado Springs, they approved um, their master transportation master plan update um, that actually officially removed Constitution and uh, Fontanero Fillmore uh, or Fontanero as major east west thoroughfare, which uh, was an argument 20 years ago, and they had it again 20 years later. So they just officially removed it from the plan, so it doesn't go through the historic down old north end of Colorado Springs. Um, Colorado Springs is also working to break ground on a central transit center right downtown to replace the current one they have. Um, there's a ramp metering project going on I-25. They did expand the northbound entrance at um, Academy Boulevard and I-25. Academy Boulevard is the south entrance to the U.S. Air Force Academy. And um, they, they've done that. That happens to be the way I get on the freeway every day. So I was thankful for that. And um, the MAMSIP, which is our military grant expansion, that is going well on the southern side of town. And then it's just um, the time for potholes. And they usually just put a pothole sensor in my car because I actually managed to hit every single one of them somehow but it is that time where we have the freeze thaw cycle and we spend more time filling potholes. So that's it. Thanks, Ollie. Pueblo area. Good morning. So we had our um, meeting last week after 
um, a month off or so. So we had quite a bit of resolutions that we needed to pass. Um, we did select our new stack representative and an alternate. Um, we also um, had a resolution to adopt the agreement between CDOT for the additional MMOF money for the GHG model update. And there was also a presentation on the Complete Streets initiative that we're working on. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, San Luis. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Vince. We had our uh, TPR meeting last week on the 23rd and things that we discussed. We had uh, Aaron Minks with us from Senator Bennett's office who reminded us that there's a new round of congressionally designated spending is beginning. So if there are any major projects or anything like that or things under municipal control and county control, uh, then this may be a good opportunity to try to get some funding in addition to our normal funding channels for that. Uh, we held elections. I was reelected chairman and Vern Hearsink was reelected our vice chairman. Uh, we had our normal construction projects update. The nearest term one that'll be resuming work is the Wolf Creek West fiber optic cable installation, which uh, if you recall, there were some contractor issues back a couple of years ago and it put that on pause. It slowed it down a great deal, but it's very important because we're going to impose uh, variable speed limits and some other smart road technology there on the west side for that descent, uh, which is always critical. Then a bunch of things that are going to add and coming up, change station upgrades, uh, some intersection improvements, and something that uh, kind of fell out of the sky and we'll always take it. It looks like there's going to be an opportunity to do some significant resurfacing on US 285 from Poncha Springs almost all the way to Johnson Village. Uh, there will be a short segment there on the north end of that that may not receive resurfacing because it uh, was done a few years ago when we widened it out, put some ACDC lanes and twiddles in there and did some resurfacing. Also, um, let's see, another big thing, we had a discussion about what local communities are doing with their ARPA money, the IIJA or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, IRA, and even the CHIPS Act probably has some things in there uh, about how to stack those funds and how to, uh, I think, uh, uh, I've heard it said, uh, borrow and blend and everything, but assemble these different pots of money to make a good project budget from. And um, talking about broadband, there's tons of broadband money coming along. And I know lots of people are still having issues with the postal service because as I said at our NACO legislative conference a couple of times, uh, it's hard to transmit pharmaceuticals and tires and other sorts of things via the internet. We still rely on USPS and we still rely on uh, FedEx and US, uh, UPS for that last mile delivery on a lot of things. So the Postal Service really needs to get squared away. But back to the point about broadband, I may have mentioned it at our last meeting, but CDOT has the Unsolicited Proposals Program. Uh, there is a project which appears to be uh, still progressing, albeit fairly slowly, by a company called Arcadian to install uh, fiber optic cable from somewhere in the Southwest up across Poncha Pass and then on down to the big switch in downtown Denver. And this will probably give us an opportunity to extend some fiber optic cable up Monarch Pass from that. So I know one of our local companies is uh, submitting a CDOT unsolicited proposal project for that. Uh, we're having a transit meeting here in the Chaffee County Courthouse tomorrow to talk about uh, improving our Bustang service and our local transit service that feeds into Bustang and how we can better coordinate that and what we can do on our end. I know there've been some issues about overnight parking with some of the Bustang coaches because they get cold at night, they can't start. Uh, we do have some maintenance shortfalls down here on our end. We don't have very large vehicle uh, diesel services that are readily available. So what can we do to help facilitate those services and make them work better? Our next TPR meeting is on May 25th and our CDOT annual meetings uh, are beginning soon. I think ours in Chavy County is going to be on March 29th. That ends my report. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, South Central. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have not had a meeting since our last uh, meeting here, but um, I do have a couple updates. One is that on March 22nd is slated to be our grand opening for the busting outrider system, the Trinidad to Pueblo run. Um, so that um, has been, it keeps getting kicked back, but I think the March 22nd is the final date. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, additionally, Warfano County received a Main Street grant for the Gardner Pavilion and a vault toilet, and um, we've been working with the Scenic Highway of Legends Board of Directors, and as they're developing some events um, that could be taking place over the summer and fall, as well as next winter. So um, that's all I have. Our next meeting is um, likely to be in April. Thank you. Thank you. Southeast. Okay, I just got a couple updates. Um, highway 50, uh, Highway 71, exchange construction is gonna start um, April to March in Rocky Ford. Uh, Lamar's 287 project from Parkway to Savage, it, um, they're finishing that up and then they'll start on the second phase. It will go from Parkway to Park and we should have a TPR meeting in a couple weeks. So I have more to report next time. Thank you. Okay. Um, Southwest there, Sarah. Yeah, good morning. Sorry, both uh, myself and Jim Candelaria were a little tardy this morning. Sorry about that. Okay. How's, how's the little one? Uh, she's awesome. That's why I was tardy. Okay. <laughs> um, we had our TPR meeting February 9th and did election of officers. I was reelected as chair and Commissioner Candelaria was reelected as vice chair. So we will be the stack representatives for um, the next year. Uh, we heard a request to add a project to our 2045 um, transportation plan, uh, which is a bicycle and pedestrian shared use path. And it's gonna connect a small community um, called Hermosa to Durango. We did approve that to be included, um, which led to a good conversation about how projects do get amended and added to the plan. And then the equity is spending within our region. So um, our region staff is gonna give us an update of that planning process at our next meeting for our new TPR uh, representatives ahead of getting into the update to the 2050 plan. Um, we approved a letter of support for La Plata County's raise grant application. They're submitting in coordination with Region 5 uh, that would make improvements to Highway 160 East between Durango and Bayfield. And that, that corridor, that section of the highway is uh, identified as a level four safety of service. There's a lot of traffic moving through there uh, and it hasn't been upgraded you know, for decades. So um, we're, we're hopeful that that project will get selected. And then there were really great operational updates from all of our, um, all the representatives, construction update from the regional staff, and we're staying busy down here. That's all I've got. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let's see, upper front range. Thanks, Vince. Uh, we haven't had any meetings yet since the last uh, stack meeting, so really nothing to update. I did have a question for you, though. Uh, with the reports and stuff, it seems like there's been a, uh, quite a bit of turnover uh, in DTR, and I just was wondering if you guys had a timeline uh, for when DTR would be uh, contracting the uh, MMOF projects. So, um MMOF, uh, oh, well, contracting them, I see. Um, you have to talk to your local region person. So that's the best I could tell you. All right. Thanks, Vince. Okay. Uh, Ute Indian. Ute Mountain. Ute Mountain. Thank you. Yeah, there is two Ute tribes, Southern Ute and Ute Mountain. Yes. <clears throat> so I got selected to be on the stack. I'm actually the chairman of the tribe also. 
So I've been on stack before. Um, we did pass it by resolution. Uh, report from Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, our 491 project from Aztec Wash to Four Corners. That's still in progress through CDOT. I think they finished up uh, early uh, winter, late fall. They still have a little bit more um, stuff to do on there, especially the scouring at the bridge of San Juan. Um, we have issues a little bit, concerns from Ute Mountain on the right-of-way maintenance agreement. We do have a current maintenance agreement right now, but up north of um, 491 off the reservation on the north side there, I don't know what mile marker it is, but we do have a lot of elk crossing right there. And I don't know if there's been any CDOT picking up any of the elk, but signage would be good, especially when the elk are going across 491 there north of the reservation line. Also, we've been addressing to our maintenance crew potholes um, along the 491 corridor. 160 seems to be okay. 41, we need to do an assessment on it on conditions of the asphalt. It has a very small shoulder on each side. Uh, we have been asking maintenance from CDOT to do mowing. They don't do mowing all the way around the right of way. So they do mowing on 491 down to a certain extent. That's why I'd really like to address the maintenance agreement again. And then we've always brought up the issue about uh, Mike Wash and 491 uh, traffic light there. <clears throat> we are getting overwhelmed with 18 wheelers coming into the travel center and traffic is getting really congested there. So I'd ask maybe CDOT or, or somebody to get a count again on how much traffic is coming through there to really justify a, a, street, a street light there. The cattle guard is also an issue, and I know we talked to CDOT about it, is they want the tribe, because it goes off at a right-of-way, to fence it so no animals go in. I'd like to <coughs> talk to you guys a little bit more about that. Some of the fencing all the way around on the right-of-way of 491, 160, and 41, <coughs> as is in every place across the state, some of it is pretty old. Uh, if, uh, livestock a horse or a cow leans on the fence it snaps and breaks and that's what happened to one of my cattle personally on 491 and it took me a year to get compensated for that cow at first they said that they wouldn't compensate me because that's what's written in the agreement but that's totally different on a government to government colorado department of transportation asked for this right away to come through so we granted it so any animals that get out on your right away, then you guys should be responsible for that. It took me a year to get the 1500 owed to me. It was a cow, Kevin, who was pregnant. So I finally got the check and then taxes come in. Now, I don't know if taxes is taxable for state, for tribes, because we're exempt from state. So right now I can't file my income tax until I get a 1099 saying I'm exempt from it. And I called them, oh, what's his name? Uh, let's see here. Jeffrey Sudemeyer about trying to address this. So that's still an issue for me personally that do I really pay tax on, taxes on something that's within the reservation boundary? I don't, I'm exempt from state taxes. So that's something else I'd like to bring up the stack here because it pertains to transportation. They keep referring me to other departments, but it comes right back to uh, <coughs> our transportation department, state of Colorado. Um, let me see what else. Uh, as we start to look at what we've done on 491 from the state line from New Mexico all the way up to the north side, it's been pretty much replaced. It's okay. Um, from 160 all the way down to four corners, we're working on that. Uh, when do we expect to see some kind of analysis on 41 going toward the Utah state line? So those are my concerns. Um, Vince, appreciate that. So that's our report from Ute Mountain. Thanks for the report. Uh, I don't know, if, Jeff, are you on? So Jeff Sudemeyer is the... Uh, financial officer for CDOT. So um, you, you might want to try and call him. 
I did already. He's a really hard guy to get back with me. Yep. He's uh, called me once and texted me another time. I'm just, I got a lot of meetings to go to myself too. So my time Still. is very limited. So I understand <clears throat> his time is limited, but we need to resolve this. Thank you. Herman. Herman. Yeah, I just want to ask, uh, and and Jeff will be on in a little bit, and I've already messaged him, uh, but I think he's in Deputy Chief Engineer interviews this morning, and that's why he's not on right now. But are you talking about a 1099 that you would have gotten that's trying to get resolved? We had some issues with some 1099s, a DPA sent out incorrectly, or is this a different issue? No, it's a 1099. First time it was... Um... <clears throat> Excuse me, I have to look at my. Let's see here, hang on. The way it was worded is one thing, but am I supposed to be taxed for this fifteen hundred that I got a check for because I'm on the reservation? Is one question, and okay. the other question was about, and I did uh, ask Jeffrey about it. Um, on yeah, the tax, tax on the 1099, it says um, NEC, a non employee compensation. So they re, rewrote it and put it back as exempt. So that's what they're resending me again. If, if, that, if I'm exempt from that or not, I don't know. Yeah, if, if you've got a pen and paper, let me write, write down my cell phone number and maybe if you can send me a text with your number. Uh, Jeff and I will make sure that we talk to you before the end of the day. Uh, it's 720-810-6934. Okay. And send me a text with your contact information, and we'll try to get this resolved today for you. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, guys. Um, FHWA. Hey Vince, this is Bill Haas. I don't hey, Bill. think John Cater is on. Um, I don't believe so. Um, just a uh, one thing real quick um, uh, related to the Safe Streets for All discretionary grant program. Um, I know there, there are some stack members that are um, recipients of the um, some of that discretionary funding um, from the, the last cycle. There was a formal kickoff webinar yesterday. Um, hopefully folks were able to attend that. If you were not able to, um, the um, webinar it was recorded and will be posted to the FHWA uh, Safe Streets for All website soon, probably the end of the week or early next week. And then the other thing is probably even more important is since those projects are being um, actively managed by the FHWA Colorado Division Office, um, we are reaching out to the recipients to do the formal kickoff meeting that we can start talking about the project and next steps and um, that type of thing. Um, the other thing I will mention is look to probably April or so and the next round of Safe Streets for All discretionary grants um, NOFO will be out on the street, so uh, pay attention to that if you're interested in applying. That's it. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> Let's see, FTA, Christian. Good morning. Following up on Bill's uh, dis discussion about funding availability, uh, FTA has two open calls for discretionary funds. Uh, the areas of persistent poverty, a $20 million program will close March 10th, and the, our large bus and bus facility discretionary program, $1.7 billion this time, will be closing April 13th. So this, um, just kind of listening to um, Keith's report earlier in the San Luis Valley, if he's looking for funds to build a, a bus facility to, to house those buses, that would be a good opportunity to look into. So thank you, that's all I have. I'll put the uh, information in the chat too. Good, thank you. Did I miss anybody?
Okay. Um, do we have a legislative report this month? Emily or oh, Jamie? it's Jamie. Hi. Um, I'll give one if you'd like one. If you want to hear my dulcet tones. Yo. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, busy in Congress as always. There's some drama. There's some not drama. And um, big thing going on right now: debt ceiling. We did hit the debt ceiling, and they are in the process of figuring out how to put together a compromise that the Senate, which is um, the majority, the Dems hold the majority, and the Republican, the GOP holds the majority in the House, how they can come together to find some sort of agreement to allow the debt ceiling to be raised so that we don't default. Um, the GOP House is proposing over $150 billion in non-military discretionary funding to be cut, uh, mostly targeting what they consider to be um, progressive policies, uh, GHG mitigation, things like that, um, diversity efforts. We don't know yet if there are any IIJA programs or any transportation programs that have been identified in those cuts yet, but we'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, hopefully none of that will affect our programs, but we'll be watching that pretty closely. Uh, China is a big deal in the Senate and the House right now. They're doing a lot of hearings on that. Not a huge impact on CDOT necessarily, but could have impacts on manufacturing down the line. Obviously, most of us are covered by Buy America, and so we have to do that, but it could impact our supplies and things that we're purchasing in transportation projects. Um, we all saw the horrible tragedy in Ohio with the train derailment. The Senate is talking a lot about rail safety right now and how to make sure something like that doesn't happen again. So there are a lot of discussions about putting together some rail legislation, um, and that is still coming out. We'll see what happens with that. Um, close to home, Phil Washington, who is currently the CEO of uh, the Denver International Airport, was in front of the Senate subcommittee tomorrow for his confirmation to lead the FAA. Uh, it's been pretty dramatic. Highly recommend looking into it. Uh, he may or may not get confirmed. We'll see. But he's he's a Denver guy for right now. So it's always fun to watch that. Um, and then Commissioner Baker did mention our federal partners have opened up their congressionally directed spending applications, also known as earmarks. Um, if anyone has a question about an earmark or um, would like help with their application, please reach out to me and I can help get you in touch with, I can either answer your question or get you in touch with one of the offices. These are for projects that are pretty small and um, mostly have funding, but need some funding to close the gap to either start or to get it over the finish line. Typically the asks are less than 2 million. I would even say less than 1.5 million. Happy to answer any questions, send you links from any of our members who are accepting earmarks. Uh, some haven't put out their applications yet, but the Senate applications are out. So just let me know. Any questions I can answer? Questions? Oh. Okay, so um, is Emily on? Herman. Yeah, um, she was going to try to be on. She's down at the Capitol and in between things. So maybe we can hold and then we'll check again towards the end of the meeting and see if she's done down there and has jumped back on, if that'll work. That'll work. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, our next item on the agenda then is safe routes to schools. Heather. Okay. So, um, we, I am on the Safe Outs to School Committee. I have been on for, oh, I don't know how many years. You all appointed me quite a few years ago. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to submit that we had um, quite a few applications and all were um, awarded and we do have a little bit of leftover money, but um, it was a actually one of the easiest processes. Um, we did have a couple applications that didn't um, actually fulfill the requirements of the application process, but all in all, it was very streamlined and 
easy sailing and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Hi, Heather, Keith Baker here. Are uh, any of those leftover funds or is there gonna be another round of uh, requests on those? I'm gonna let uh, Marissa step in, step in with that. Okay, thank you. And I'm here as well today with um, Melissa Houghton. She manages our Safe Rest to School program. So Melissa, please um, chime in too. But my understanding is that when we have leftover funding, we just roll that into our next call for projects um, and, and um, are able to fund larger um, projects in our next call. Um, Melissa, do you have anything you want to add to that? That's correct. We'll just um, reserve that money and just add it to our $5 million um, balance for FY, um, I guess it's 24-25. No, sorry, 25-26. Other questions? Let's see, Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, has there, I guess, maybe first question building on Mr. Baker's question there. What, what, what is the? I, I, did I hear twenty five, twenty six for the for the next call? And has there been any thought? You know, I think these are uh, very important funds funding a lot of very important projects. Has there been any thought of doing a, a just a second call on this, maybe six months from now? Uh, so, typically, uh, do you want me to answer? Marissa, or do you want me? Um, go for it, and I'll, I'll okay. add some thoughts too. Oh, okay. Um, I was just going to say that um, some of you that may have been around for a little while um, may remember that we did used to do annual calls for project. And then um, in FY19, the committee had made the strategic decision to move to the every other year um, call for projects. And so I don't believe there's any plans to um, reconsider that at this point, just because the amount of time um, and um, contracting process, you know, the, the whole thing um, to do another call for project um, would have, I think would just create a lot more, um, I think it would be really difficult um, to do. But Marissa, did you want to add anything to that? No, I agree. And I think that we have, um, you know, other funding applications out right now. For example, our transportation alternatives program, we do ongoing um, grant solicitations for revitalizing main streets, um, you know, complementary to some of the work that we do with Safe Routes to School. So I think, you know, perhaps we're seeing just a little bit of um, grant fatigue and there's a lot out there. So I think maybe the timing would be better if we just wait and then we could supplement this funding, which is very important, um, would probably be better served if we waited just a little bit longer. But I agree with everything Melissa said as well. And I'll just add in as a, a Safe Routes member, I think this is my second or third round of this, it, third actually. So I've been doing this for six years. Um, God, that's awful. Um, Somebody else needs to step up next year, by the way. Um, anyway, you know, it's really a time consuming process, not just from the consultant side of things, but also from the group when we do the, re the actual review of the projects and then actually meet and have those discussions. This isn't a, a quick and dirty turnaround. This is three to four months. So it's not what you would think um is easily done so i i would say that the two-year process is working pretty well understand all that makes a lot of sense i i just hate to leave you know over two million dollars on the floor but understand where you guys are coming from thank you okay scott Thanks, Vince. I'm curious with these funds, you know, our, our small municipalities are, are really reliant on these funds. I think, of, for example, Milliken right now in uh, the North Front Range, they're putting together a project request uh, uh, that has to do with an, uh, like a CDBG request for an ADA ramp. And I'm curious as to whether the the, the measure that's being inserted in, in a lot of legislation uh, around uh, disproportionately impacted communities, is, is that something that is being considered when it comes to this funding or uh, I, I'm curious because this money is so important to the smaller communities. A lot of those smaller communities in Weld County are in those uh, 
uh, disproportionately impacted census blocks. Um, I can offer, I might can maybe let Heather talk about how maybe the, the, the nine member safe routes to school advisory committee thinks of that when they, when they are scoring the applications. I can't speak to that since it's not a CDOT scored um, applications, but for one thing on the CDOT side that we did do um, this cycle is we aligned the safe routes to school program with the MMLF um, um, uh, reduced or limited, we eliminated the match rates consistent with um, MMOF um, for communities so that um, DI communities um, do not have to put up um, the 20% um, um, match if they, if they fall into that criteria consistent with the MMOF. Um, Heather or Melissa, do you want to add on to that with other thoughts? I mean, I, I don't think that there is a a hurdle um, like there used to be with the safe routes um, funding. And I think the hardship is getting the application submitted and having it be complete. I know Melissa does an amazing job with, you know, circling back, making sure they're answering all the questions, making sure that there's a lot of pre-work before the application deadline. As I said, this is an extensive application that we review. So ensuring that there's a lot of pre-meetings before the submission and making sure that it's quite thorough. Um, you know, I, I, I agree, Commissioner James, when, you know, I live in a community that has a lot of, you know, smaller, smaller areas that could really benefit with this. And it's a matter of getting these communities to apply. And it's almost, you know, through in the past, We've looked at some of these applications and gone, wow, they have a great grant writer. What about the little guy that doesn't have anyone? And how do we ensure that these guys get into the process as well? And so I think with what we've done with MMOF and, and decreasing the match has definitely helped and is, is hopefully opening that window with uh, Melissa's help to guide them through the process better to get more applicants who are disadvantaged to apply and realize that they're more than likely going to get the reward. Well, and Heather, let me ask, let me chime in there. I'm confused as to why we're leaving two million bucks on the table. I look at you know my little community by me of, of Millican. Uh, was their application DQ'd? I, I, are we reaching back out to them and saying, "Hey, we got two million dollars left, and this was a little funky with your application. Can we help you fix it?" I, I guess that's that's my curiosity there. I mean, Melissa, do you want to chime in? Sure. And I'm sorry, my video, I it says that it's on and it's not showing me. So, um, but anyway, yeah. So um, I think what the committee um, and Heather, you know, if she wants to add any more to this, when we're reviewing applications, um, I think, you know, first there's that technical review to make sure that the application does um, meet all of, it contains all of the information that we're asking. And so you mentioned about Millican, that was not the case with the Millican um, funding. They were not disqualified. Um, they had information um, that met, um, I guess, sort of the, the benchmark. So go ahead and be reviewed. Um, but, you know, the committee goes through all of the applications. They score each section. So then we average the scores. And certain projects just really rise to the top and other projects, you know, tend they are scoring lower. And so um, the committee then makes a decision when looking at the projects. Is it something that is pretty minor um, that I would reach back out to the applicant and say, you know, could you clarify this? Or are there um, certain things that they requested that are ineligible that um, the committee is going to remove from their project? And so if that's the case, you know, I let the applicant know that the advisory committee is interested in their project, but they may find certain things that are ineligible, whatever it may be, would the applicant like to continue to move forward? So generally that happens when there's a, a small, um, you know, a pretty minor component of the application. But when we receive applications that have multiple issues um, or concerns about the actual design of the project, um, that's, that's a little, it, it's almost like the applicant would need to put in a whole new application, provide additional information, 
meet all of the different requirements and that kind of thing. And so at that time, when we receive applications that are either very unclear, you know, don't contain information, or maybe the project's just not in alignment with what we're uh, looking to fund, then the committee makes the decision not to fund the project. So well, there's um, the magic word when it's out of alignment with what the committee is looking to fund. Is it arbitrary? Is that laid out? I, you know, I look in, in this particular instance, Millikan's not getting any money. Uh, Boulder, which is not disproportionately impacted and uh, really doesn't have a problem with, with funding, is, is getting funded. I, I'm just curious to compare the contrast to the two. These small municipalities that I'm kind of fighting for here in, in, in Weld County, it's so hard for them to cobble together money. So when there is an opportunity in a program like this that is conducive to that, I'm, I'm just curious as to... To, to why? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, to, I guess, answer your first question, um, most definitely there, it, it's not arbitrary. I mean, there are specific, um, you know, like we, um, I was going to say the specific rules that a community needs to um, uh, agree to for our funding. Um, uh, the the ap actual application, if you went into our great instruction manual, it provides an incredible amount of detail as far as how each application is going to be scored. So we do provide a funding matrix um, that applicants can look at and say, okay, this is where they're going to get receive points for, um, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever it may be in their project. So um, I would say that I, I feel like in the time that I've been with the committee, this is my second um, grant application cycle. Um, in, in this role with the committee. And I, I really feel that everybody really would like to award this money out um, to any of the projects. Um, we work really hard to try and work with communities, um, but there are just instances when the project just has concerns all around um, that the committee makes the decision not to award it. And I think um, we do that because I, um, you know, when these projects, if we were to, you know, put the project in um, and then there are issues, you know, that creates, that continues, it's a whole cycle, right? Like in each of the regions. Um, so unfortunately there are projects that um, just don't get funded, um, don't um, meet the criteria that that's needed um, to be funded. And, and you're exactly right. We do have money that um, we haven't awarded this cycle, uh, but I, I think that the advisory committee would say that they feel really um, good about the projects that they are funding and that there were concerns about the projects that they weren't funding and they didn't feel that they would be doing their, their role if they were to fund some of these projects with the level of concerns that were um, apparent. So you'd rather leave $2 million on the table and not reach out to those communities. I, I guess I'm, I'm really confused by that. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, we don't, I don't think any of us like are, are happy, like, oh, well, we have some money um, that are left over. Um, typically, we do um, award all of our funds. Uh, but I, I do think that we would have to look at like the, the, um, essentially the fairness of it. So we've never historically gone back to any community and say, here's an opportunity for you to completely redo your application and, you know, do all these things um, to, to apply or for us to reconsider it. It just isn't how, how the committee has operated um, in the past. And, um, you know, the, the funding isn't necessarily going away as we said that it would be um, moved to our next, um, next, next cycle. In that two years that we wait, the kids that are walking to school in that middle school without sidewalks, I, I'm just saying. I, 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 you know what, and I, I, I mean, I will tell you, it is the toughest thing in the entire world because, you know, Melissa hit the nail on the head. When we look at these things, all we want to do is give away all the money. We totally do. The hardship is, is when you have an application that has so many holes or differentiations from what the actual guidelines are, it, it turns into what she said, a, a full reapplication. And then the fairness fast factor gets cut, kicked in of, okay, are we just opening it up for another round at that point? Because if we allow one community to do this and reset and reapply, then why aren't we letting all communities reapply and extending the deadline? And so that kind of goes into what Marissa was saying with 
what is the time frame? How does this work with fairness? And it is incredibly difficult. I, I trust me, it is the hardest thing. And this year was the first year where we weren't looking at four or five or even six or seven going, oh, they're incomplete. This isn't going to work. We'd have to go back and back and back. And it's, it's hard. I, it is, that's the hardest part of this is to keep it consistent and fair for the entire state and realizing, yes, money is probably going to be left on the table and it super sucks. I don't know what else to say other than that. Okay. I, well, I'll grant you that fairness. I get, I get that. I acknowledge that. That's, that's, that's fair. Um, that being said, do we fire these applications back at the communities who fell short with critiques on how they can not fall yes. in two years? Okay, good, good. Thank Without you. a doubt, they are getting um, a lot of hands on, hey, this is where this fell short. So okay. hopefully the next round they can have a complete package and get that money. Good deal. Thank you. Thanks. And perhaps even sooner with the TAP and other grants we have available too. Okay, thank you. I, I was hey, just going to, yeah, I was just going to stick in with a comment here that, um, you know, maybe there is a way to notify us to the members who are on the committee. I hate to add one more thing on your plate, but one of the things that might help is, you know, reaching out to the regions like PPACG and saying, hey, um, this application for this rural community here, you know, maybe it was, I don't know, Calham and saying the application was um, just terrible and, um, and saying they're going to need help the next time around. Um, because we have, you know, we, when, when we have managed to get, um, a grant in PPACG that's a big one like MAMSIP or um, the, the grant that we got for the gap, we know who on El Paso County staff at least was uh, is a great grant writer. And so maybe if you can just reach out to us privately and say, hey, someone in your community needed this money, but they don't have really a lot of help with a grant writer. And, um, and so we're just reaching out to you, see, because I'm going to be term limited here in three years. So the next application cycle, I'll be around, but then I'm gone. And so just reaching out to John Leosados and saying, hey, can we maybe get some help here for these uh, folks to write the grant next time? Or when it comes up to the TAP alternative, you know, the TAP grants, um, let's see if we can't get someone to help them write, write their application. And, and I couldn't agree more. I have said that, you know, resoundingly throughout this process, Holly. I, I mean, we have a rock star grant writer in the city of Steamboat, but we don't have anybody in South Route or, you know, in West Moffat County in Rio Blanco. And it's like, these are the communities that need it. So how do we help them? And I, I mean, I don't know if there is a magic wand of a regional grant writer, you know, advisor or something, but something needs to happen for these smaller communities because, you know, Big Brother Steamboat's going to win every time over Yampa, and that's not right. And I don't feel like it should be right for any of our communities. This should be evenly spread across the, the, the state and anything that we can do, I can assure you that I, I believe that Melissa is going to help reach out and at least inform you know, see dot of hey, these guys have their their you know skin in the game, but they just haven't cut the cake well enough. And hopefully, for the next cycle, we can do something to help bridge that gap for them. Okay, so Holly, just uh, for your information, you know, the TAP is only a three-year program; it'll be renewed. But right now is when the applications are going in for the next three years. Yeah, and it made our newspaper too. So all right, we'll make sure that we get you know people out there who might have uh, applied and say, hey, we need to get out there and apply for it. So thank you. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So it looks like we're at break time. So let's take a ten minute break. So we'll come back at ten.
Hey Vince. Real quick, we need to make we need to take action on the safe routes thing. It was an action item. I, I don't want to interfere you taking a break, but we do need to do that. You can't hear him anyway. He's gonna... Heather. Yeah. Okay. We can do that. All right. Bye. Okay, um, 10 o'clock, it's time to come back. We're addressing uh, right now um, poor interstate pavement, and we need to provide a recommendation to the committee, uh, to the uh, Transportation Commission. Um, they may not hear it next meeting, but we uh, need to be ready to, to answer them or give them our recommendation at the next report, report cycle. Hey, Vince. Yeah? We, before we start, we're supposed to be taking action on the safe routes to school. So we need to actually approve that. Okay. Okay, so what action are we, we doing? Um, recommend uh, the funding, the recommended projects for funding. Okay, so for approval. Yes. Okay, uh, is there a motion? Is, it, is there a motion to recommend approval of the funded uh, Safe Route to Schools recipients? Uh, oh. Holly Williams, so moved. Okay, is there a second? Second, Brian Pettit. Okay, further discussion? Hearing none, is there anybody against? Hearing none, the motion is approved. Got it, Heather? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now we're moving on to the poor interstates. And, and uh, William Johnson is away right now. And so we have a different presenter. Yes, thank you. I'm Toby Manthe with the Asset Management Program at CDOT and I'll be presenting uh, today. Okay, thanks Toby. Okay, so, um, Good morning, committee members. We are happy to be here today to give you an overview of really a new strategy we have for addressing some of our more troublesome interstate pavement sections. Uh, we presented this information to the Transportation Commission last month, and we certainly wanted to inform Stack as well. Now, when we typically talk about asset management at pavement and pavement at CDOT, we're discussing pavement on all Colorado highways and we typically talk about it in terms of our internal metric, which is drivability life. Today, we're focusing only on the pavement for our interstates, and we're doing that through the lens of FHWA's national metrics, 
which all state DOTs are assessed on. And those measures really look at pavement by rating them at, in terms of good, fair, and poor condition. I know some MPOs are familiar with that metric as they are involved in target setting for the national highway system. Uh, next slide, please. So the federal metrics are really, you know, definitely a relatively new way of choosing projects. As CDOT, we first began using these measures about five years ago, and we have seen an uptick in our poor inventory. Uh, we had less than 1% poor in 2017, and it's been increasing steadily to 3.9% poor today. Now, FHWA would like all states to be uh, below 5% poor on their interstates, so that's not too much of a jump from where we're at. A few states like Delaware and Michigan have already surpassed that 5% mark. Now, once that happens, FHWA begins restricting the use of certain federal funds. Um, these funds, which are National Highway Performance Program funds, are some of CDOT's most flexible funds. Um, we really like to keep that flexibility for programs that need it. Um, if we do go past 5% poor, we would have to obligate $130 million of those funds each year to poor interstates until we get below 5% poor. And if we can only use those funds for poor interstates, that loss of flexibility could really disrupt some of our current plans for other CDOT programs. So all this to say that we do want to ensure that the percentage of our poor interstates starts trending downward, both because we don't wanna lose that flexibility and because we all have an interest in the quality of our interstates. Next slide, please. So I think that map did a really good job of showing, you know, we're not where we want to be at CDOT in terms of this uh, measure. And so under the direction of Director Liu and our Asset Management Oversight Committee, we've done an analysis of just what it would take to remedy this. And, you know, when we initially looked at the numbers, they were a little daunting. It was $200 million or more. Uh, but what is heartening is that we did some analysis of one, what's already in our, our pavement or our surface treatment program in the outer years and what projects we could shift and to what was already in the 10-year plan. And working with the regions, we found we already had a vast majority of this needed work paid for in some way. And where it wasn't planned, we could make adjustments and, and cover it. Additionally, uh, the TC in December approved some redistribution funds for this very issue. And so uh, thanks to the TC, those dollars will also help to offset, offset some of this cost. We're going to show you now what we believe is a good game plan for addressing these troublesome pavement spots. And under the direction of Director Liu, we formalized uh, this project list so we can visualize and track just what projects we're making going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is that big project list we've been working on, and it's divided into three key parts. The first nine projects you see up there at the top are what we're calling strategic projects. And those are projects that really need some additional funding still. Uh, the next group, those four under the existing projects category are those that are not already fully funded and planned. And lastly, just to illustrate some of the good work that's been going on, we show a diamond grind that we completed near Fort Morgan about a year or so ago uh, that really knocked out a substantial chunk of our federal poor. So taken together, these projects, we expect they'll move us from about 158 poor lane miles in 2021 to 55 lane miles after the projects are completed. Um, you can also look at this as going from 3.9% poor to about 1.4% poor. One really big caveat we want to give um, is that this does not account for anything that could become poor in future years. And that could really be a surprise. It could be a really big issue depending on how things shake out. Um, so it's not an issue we're discounting. Next slide, please. So let's skip this slide. It's, it's mostly included in the next um, slide. Um, so you can see here that we have included those costs of these projects in that fourth to the last column. And it does add up to about $234 million. So initially, when we saw that, you know, that's a very daunting estimate. But as I mentioned, our payment team and the regions did a good job of figuring out what we can pay for through existing programs. And you can see that's about $171 million. You can see in the right far column that we have the year of delivery. About half of these projects would be delivered in 2024. 
Most of the other projects would be due delivered in 2025 due to some complexities unique of to each project. That's why they're being pushed out that far. Um, and the recommended treatments you see are a mix of minor rehabs, major rehabs, slab replacements, and other treatments. In the next slide, we'll look at the cost of these projects in comparison to the funding gap we're facing. So again, this is just to show we can pay for most of this through existing program funds, surface treatment, the 10-year plan. There's even some bridge dollars in there. Um, we do have some one-time funds, as I mentioned, that are also helping to pay for this. Uh, the Transportation Commission approved that $10 million in December for federal poor. And we also have been setting aside in the recent years some of our normal asset management um, budget for this because we have been anticipating that it may become an issue. All this to say that we're left with an unfunded amount of about 37 million. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Here you can see that we don't think this unfunded amount has to come in one shot. We would spread it over three years, most likely. And you know, most likely that source of funding for this unfunded, unfunded amount is federal redistribution dollars. Um, really, it's like unspent money from the highway trust fund that comes to us later. So uh, there is a potential that we could borrow from other asset programs to realize these projects, but that's not anticipated at this time. Next slide, please. Uh, the last thing we wanted you to remember about this, I wanted to reiterate that this does not solve this poor pavement interstate problem forever. As long as there's this federal measure and as long as this restriction can be imposed, this is likely to be an ongoing concern for us. The projects we discussed today should do a good job of fixing most of the interstate poor pavement out there, but it does not account for pavement again that may become poor. Um, to give you an example of how, how big of an issue that can be, we think that 40% of the 3.6% poor for 2022 was entirely new poor. Um, so to better address the interstates going forward, we are looking to changes in the surface treatment program to, you know, improve how it considers interstates. And we'll be looking to highlight this need with the TC as it arises each year, as new poor segments emerge. Um, we want to make sure that the, the TC is considering this issue when federal redistribution dollars are considered going forward. Uh, overall, the message here is, you know, we think this is a really solid effort from the executive team and certainly the regions um, were great about adjusting their plans. And we think we have a good plan that positions us where we want to be, but we still need to be watchful for that, that emerging interstate pour should that happen. Um, so that's our presentation for today. We have some maps that were included in your packet, I believe, that talks about where all the projects are, um, what the project links uh, links are in each um, location. Uh, but that was our overview for today. Questions? Okay, Suzette. Yeah, thanks, Vince. Um, Toby, thanks for that presentation. I think as we were talking about this internally and getting ready for this meeting, there was some conversation about how do you measure poor on the interstate system? And is it a federal measurement? And, and is that federal, how the feds measure whether the interstate's in poor condition? Is it the same as CDOT measurement of that? I guess I just maybe trying to get some um, clarity around how these measurements happen and are, are they consistent between CDOT and the feds? If you could help yeah. answer that. Uh, so it's absolutely a federal measure um, and it came out a couple years ago. The way we measure is we have bands that go around and they have very precise sensors that um, use lasers and all kinds of things to measure um, what we call distresses in pavement, like rutting, cracking, smoothness. And um, the federal measures, we collect them at the same time we collect distresses for the CDOT measure, which is drivability life. And drivability life measures many of the same distresses that the federal measure uses. 
but the results are not the same because Drivability Life uses other metrics that the federal measure does not. So uh, currently CDOT thinks that Drivability Life is a more comprehensive way of evaluating payment health, and that's why we use that. Um, but in, in, in a nutshell, they use some of the same indicators, but Drivability Life uses indicators that the federal measure does not use. And um, if you want more on that, we have, I think Laura Conroy's on the line. Um, Laura, did you have anything to add to that? I think you described that well. Um, if they have additional questions, I can answer them. Do you have a follow-up to that or is that what you needed? Yeah, I was just, you know, I just wanted to make sure that we're not letting the federal, um, the federal way the feds are looking at the payment source sneaking up on us. Um, and, but it sounds like you guys are all are, are measuring that at the same time you're measuring it through the right ability. Correct. We're, we definitely have our eyes on this and we are looking at what's becoming poor based on the federal metrics and it's on our radar for sure. Okay, so there's two questions in a chat, and then we have one in person. So let's take the two in the chat first. Does, um, let's see, where was it? Is it lane mile or center lane mile? Um, I, I lane miles. Lane yeah. miles, yeah. And it's in one direction of the highway. Okay. Does diamond grinding really fix the problem? Do you want me to take that, Toby? Okay, so for concrete payments, the federal metrics are looking at both smoothness and faulting. So your diamond grind will take care of both smoothness and faulting um, and get us out of poor. Okay, Roger. Uh, yes, thank you, Vince. Um, I guess the, the question I have, and I do have a little bit of experience. I was in, with staff materials um, there in Denver for eight years. Um, we used, I believe the program was called Darwin uh, to do pavement design. Um, and at the time, I, I always felt that was kind of slanted and uh, towards the concrete industry. Um, are we seeing or doing any data analysis to see if concrete is really the best bang for our buck? Um, it's highly uh, more expensive. The, um, the panels, just from my observations driving around the state, you, uh, you actually absolutely know when you enter Colorado, especially I-70 corridor through Kansas. And I tow a trailer um, and it is, that stuff is horrible to drive on. And um, and I would just like to, to question whether or not we're getting the best bang for our buck by continuing to use a more expensive product that the recyclability is replacing panels and grinding, which really I think is a very temporary fix. The only highway that I see that has really lasted the 30 year life of it is the I-70 corridor around rifle where they've used absolute select material and you have very little movement in the ground below it, where is other places like I-76, I-25 North, I-70 um, in the Western Slope and east of, uh, on the Eastern Plains has more soil uh, moving and causing issues. So just a quick question on with staff materials, are they still using that program and are we actually getting the best bang for our buck? Thank you. So, Pavement designers are now using Pavement ME Design, which is a new program. It's not Darwin. And it's uh, came out, you know, it's Ashto's new program. It came out, I think we've been using it since about 2014. And it's, I think, using finite element methods. Um, so that's kind of what the new Pavement Design program is doing. Some of the areas that you mentioned, um, I-76 has some concrete that was put down over 30 years ago. At the time, they did not use dowel bars. All of the new concrete pavement that goes down in the state uses the dowel bars. So 
the new concrete pavement, we don't have the faulting concern um, that you might have mentioned on some of those older I-76 pavements. And I think there's an old section up on I-25 that does not have, dow have dowel bars. And that's why you have that faulting um, and you really feel it when you're driving over it. On that pavement list, there is money going towards I-70 near Canarado border. That area of concrete pavement has an ASR problem. Um, it's being addressed through this strategic list because we know that's also a problem. That was kind of a unique situation. Again, it was an older pavement and it was a materials problem on that one. But I think overall the concrete pavements, the way the materials specifications are set up now and the new pavement design program are having good results in the, whenever you know, a, a large project is looked at, we do do a life cycle cost analysis and that is a 40 year life cycle cost to evaluate asphalt versus concrete. And, you know, sometimes asphalt might be the more the chosen product because over the 40 year lifespan, it is the, you know, least amount of cost. And sometimes concrete is chosen, but it's analyzed on all the new projects, anything over $3 million worth of payment. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, Scott. Thanks, Vince. I was just firing away questions in the chat. I just thought I'd, I'd hop on here and, and ask uh, because I'm a, a disc jockey, darn it, not a civil engineer. So please help me understand. I have asked out of genuine curiosity. Uh, when I was... Uh, give you a parable. When I when I was a kid, I went to school out at NJC and I went out there and I took trigonometry. So I drove up and down I-76 a lot. So here I am taking trigonometry, knowing that I would never use it again in my life. And by the way, I haven't. So therefore, I would study for the test. If the H FHA, FHWA has a test for us to set up and, and smoothness is one of those factors, we're diamond grinding to attain smoothness, but do we truly, is it truly investing in our infrastructure? Or are we just studying for the test per se? That, I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking the engineers, but it seems to me if we're spending money diamond grinding and not getting any prolonged life out of the, out of the pavement, that's, that's, uh, that's the definition of insanity. I'm, I'm just curious. Well, if we had all the money in the world, we would re re probably rebuild large sections of interstate. We do not have all the money in the world at this point. So we're trying to strategically do projects that are not throwaway projects that actually do improve the road for 10 years at a minimum. Um, you know, we would love to reconstruct, but we have limited dollars in surface treatment and in CDOT in general. So uh, my, my curiosity, though, still lies in, does diamond grinding extend the lifetime, the expend the, the useful life of the highway, or are you studying for the test? Well, it'll improve it, the ride for probably eight to 10 years. But a lot of, you know, our overlays on asphalt are... 10 year life, you know, improvements as well. So it's a, it is a way to, it's a rehab, you know, it's a rehabilitation and rehabilitations are around 10 years where they improve the pavement life. So it does improve the life. It was a question, not a statement. Okay. Well, Yes, it should improve. It should improve it for ten years. Okay. Thank or you. Close to ten. We're hoping for close to ten. No, I'm just going to text. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Vince. Because well, okay. and I'm I'm yeah. using my drivability life metric. So it's the drivability life. How drivable is it? So it makes it drivable for another eight to ten years without that roughness. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes sense. I mean, it's it's a, it's a better for the traveling public because they're not tearing up the front end on their car. Uh, but at the same time, we're truly not getting any more extended life out of the pavement. We're making it more drivable, but we're not it, 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 we're not prolonging the life, so to speak. Yeah, I guess we're prolonging the drivable life, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> we just went in a government circle right there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? So the approach is to approve the $37 million that we're short right now and how you're going to uh, access that money. Is that correct? I believe we're asking for approval of the general plan of tackling this issue. Um, we haven't made decisions quite now about how we're paying for that 37 million. We anticipate it will be through federal redistribution over the next several years. So basically what we're approving then is the approach to the repair yes. of the interstate. Okay. Yes. So is there a motion? Mr. Chair, move to approve Nicholas Williams. Okay. Is there a second? Keith Mr. Baker, I'll second. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded that we're approving or recommending the approach uh, that is presented to us for the repair of the poor. Uh, interstates, uh, highways in our state. Further discussion? Mr. Chair, won't be unanimous. I'll stand in opposition to this. It's, it's, we're, we're band-aiding something that uh, we're spending money to make the FHAW, FHW hap, FHWA happy and not, we're not in, investing in our asset. So I'll be in opposition. Now, I might be alone in that, but that's fine. Scott Weaver from Yuma County. I'm going to stand with Scott James. Um, I, I don't think this is a, an appropriate approach. Um, all we're doing is delaying the inevitable. So, Anybody else? Kevin? Yes, I'm going to stand in opposition as well for the upper. Yeah, Central Front Range is going to stand in opposition also, along with Commissioner James. <clears throat> uh, this is Chris from EPPR. I joined Scott. In the opposing. Can I make a comment real quick? Go ahead. So I, I am not trying to step on any of your guys' toes, but before we vote, um, so when I was in engineering school, and that was eons ago, I had to argue against the Asphalt Paving Association president at Ohio State, in, for the state of Ohio, and argue for concrete. You had to pick a side, I picked concrete. I think the hardship is when you look at asphalt paving, and I wish Toby and um, Laura, you could bring up the lifespan of asphalt versus concrete and what this looks like. What, what they are trying to convey is, and I'm trying to make this a layman's thing and not an engineering thing for you guys. You have an asphalt lifespan that's, I mean, I'm sure the materials are much better than it was 30 years ago, but you have a lifespan for asphalt that's between eight and 12 years. You have a lifespan for concrete that's between, you know, 12 to 20, depending on weather and environment and whatever you put in the concrete mix. What this is doing and saying is if you take a quarter inch lift off of the asphalt and you, 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 you basically put a, a tiny lift on it, you're going to, you're going to give that asphalt paving another probably four to seven years. If you do a diamond grind on concrete, you're, you're extending the life of the chronic concrete five to seven years. If you look at that graph, which we all looked at in engineering school, the life of, of concrete is still predominantly best. This is not the you know, smoking gun to say, this is going to fix all the problems in the state of Colorado or, you know, FH, you know, statewide or 
um, countrywide on what, what's going on, but this is helping um, prolong the life of your surface, your drivability surface. The, the issue is, is that it is, it is expensive to replace concrete. The ideal is to pave right over concrete. And, you know, you have then a ironclad surface that lasts a long time and is less expensive to, to, to you know, fit, to fix. But unfortunately, that's extremely cost prohibitive. I mean, what we're trying to, I think what Toby and Laura are trying to convey here is that there is a process. They are trying to convey a, you know, longer process to keep getting these funds to extend the life of pavement, realizing that in some areas you're going to have to replace. And, but you're not going to have to do it. You know, if we don't do this, then we are going to literally be replacing sooner than later if we don't continue to what you're saying, Scott, you know, put a band aid on the problem. Now, Toby, totally correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I think of it and how I was taught that what you guys are conveying is an extension of life of ultimate, all, all highway systems, road systems are going to have to be replaced. This is just prolonging the life a little more. Heather, and thank you. That's that's what I'm after there is, is uh, you're a civil engineer. I'm a disc jockey for crying out loud. It makes me just smart enough to run my mouth. So, but what I'm say, if the, the, the concrete, we lay down shiny new I-25 payment, like what we have in my neck of the woods, and you're going to get quote, you're going to get 10 out of it. Now I know it's much longer, but I'm simple and I got to use simple math. You get 10 years out of it. So you get six years into this and we say, boy, it's getting rough. And the FHA, FHWA is on our rear end, so therefore we should diamond, grade, diamond grind this to make it smoother. If you're still just getting 10 years, that's a waste of money. But you're if not. I'm diamond grinding, you're, you're still, so that's the thing. You're not going to see the, oh my goodness, it's starting to deteriorate until you're about one to two years from the end of life. And that's when you want to step in because there's other graphs that show even with asphalt and with concrete, if you don't step in two to three years prior to end of life, then you are going to have to do an incredible, I mean, you're doing heart surgery instead of stitching. So what they're trying to do is say, hey, let's go in and put stitches in and not completely go into the cavity, take out the heart and try to replace it. So this is, this is the differentiation is, you know, you have to extend that span and they're doing it before the end of life occurs. So, it, but you do get an extension on the back end yes. of life, so to speak. Okay. Yes. Then I withdraw my, my, my being a pain in the butt. I, I just want to make sure that if we're diamond grinding at six into the 10 and we're still only, only got to get 10, that's ridiculous. But if we're diamond grinding six into the 10 and we get 12, that makes sense. If, if I make sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. James. Yes, uh, James Usher with uh, CDOT Region 4. So, you know, I, I understand a lot of the sen sentiments there um, and, and the feeling that ultimately is like, really, it's like you're just putting a Band-Aid on it. But it is, I mean, I would equate it to uh, the diamond grinding. It's it's similar to with asphalt. With asphalt, once you start getting faulting and cracking, we come through and you either do chip seals, uh, crack sealing or even overlay ultimately is like you're prolonging that pavement section. So what that diamond grinding does ultimately, yes, it, it's, it smooths it out, but you know, on top of the diamond grinding, the other things that we do is we go through and we reseal all the joints. So as far as water getting in there and the, the, the frost heave and things that happen along with that, you do get a benefit out of that. Prime example that I would use is one of the sections that's on this federally poor list right now is uh, I-25 north of Mulberry. If you look at those concrete slabs, the slabs themselves structurally are sound. It's just, it's a very, very rough ride. So ultimately it's, you're still, you still have the soundness of the concrete, that pavement section, but you're gonna, you're gonna get a smoother ride out of it. And I'd equate it to the same thing as driving down a gravel road. You drive down a gravel road and it starts to get washboarded. What happens if you don't go through there and, and replay that every once in a while? That, that washboarding is just gonna be compounded. James in Weld County, you just go faster. That's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Okay. So I, uh, I just wanted to add that real quick. Okay, Kevin. 
I, I may have missed it, and I apologize, and I appreciate the additional conversation that's come up here. And, and thanks, James, for your comments regarding it, it kind of being a Band-Aid here. Uh, how much is this moving the needle, though, on – uh, we, you know, you showed the percentage wise at the start of this, how much are we moving the needle by this progress or this process, excuse me. In terms of the percent, we yeah. anticipate it would go from about 4% poor to about 1.4% poor, assuming there is no new issues that come up. So it, it gets rid of most of our existing poor out there from the federal perspective. Okay, thank you. Okay, Roger. Yeah, thank you again, Vince. Yeah, I was not questioning whether or not um, CDOT should go ahead and do these um, fixes because with asphalt, you're gonna have fixes as well. Um, you're gonna have pushing and shoving. Uh, what my question was is, is it wise to continue putting down asphalt on interstates when we know we have that problem on I-25 we had the problem on I-76. You know, I, I understand and I and I hear all of the design stuff. I worked in design, highway design. I worked in staff materials. I always questioned how much did the concrete industry have in involvement in FHWA's decision to put out Darwin, especially. I'm glad to hear there's a new program out there. Um, is it unbiased, I guess is the question. I, I understand what CDOT is saying and what the people are saying, but I also understand when I drive into Colorado coming from Kansas, that's a fairly new highway and it's not in good shape. We are replacing it at a very high cost. If we have a shortfall in funding, wouldn't it make more sense to quit building in concrete, which is more expensive to maintain when it does fail as opposed to asphalt, when you can recycle that, you can mill out two inches of that, you can go in and put that back down. We have cold recycles that literally the train picks it up and puts it back down at the same time, less impact to the traveling public. Um, when you travel those I-70 corridor or the corridors, not I-70, I-25, and they're doing these major concrete panel replacements. And, and I don't know that I buy that the, a lot of those panels are in good shape. I buy what I feel in my butt and what I see with my eyes when I'm traveling the highways. So if we got a shortfall, why are we spending additional money on, on a system that costs more and it's questionable whether or not we're getting the best bang for the buck? So I was never insinuating that we shouldn't proceed with the required maintenance, and that's what it is, whether it's um, grinding of the ass or the uh, concrete, replacing panels, and that's what the these programs show when you're designing these highways. But if we're short on money, why are we buying the Cadillac when we could be replacing it with asphalt and uh, getting extended life and having a lower cost of repairs when it needs to be done? So that's what I was pointing out. Thank you, everyone. Okay, other questions? I do do a, a, you know, like a life cycle cost analysis, as Laura said, and we are taking steps to improve that pavement um, near the Kansas border. Other questions? We have a motion on the floor to approve the approach that they're taking to fix the poor interstates. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, those opposed, uh, I guess you raise your hands. One, Scott, did you have your up? Uh, Vince, I'll move to supporting it because Heather told me I should. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I got I got one opposed. Is there any further opposition? Chris Richardson's opposing. Chris? Yes, thanks. Hearing no further opposition, the motion carries that we're approving the approach they're taking. 
I have a question, Toby or Laura, could you guys possibly send out like a life cycle graph for people to understand what it looks like with asphalt versus concrete? So there's a greater understanding and education of what a mill and fill versus a, a diamond grind looks like for the life of, of the surface. I know that they're out there. I mean, at least they were 30 years ago. I can't imagine that they are, you know, they're still present. Yeah, we'll, we'll send you what we, we'll look into that and send you something for sure. Okay, I think that so would be insanely helpful for everyone to understand what this, what, what we're really talking about. Yeah, and the thing of it is, is all these questions that we're presenting are probably going to be the same questions that you're going to receive from the commission. And so, um, so the, I need to deal with that. Chris, do you, did you have a question? Okay, that was just a hand that flew up. Um, Okay, that turned out okay. So we'll see where that goes and I'll try and present your ideas and, and comments and concerns to the commission when we go over this at their meeting in two weeks. Okay, uh, uh, let's see, fiscal year 24, uh, final budget approval. The commission is going to approve the budget at their meeting this month. And we have the opportunity to recommend, make a recommendation to them. So annual budget. Yeah, thank you, Vince. Um, good morning. I'm Bethany Nicholas. Oh, I'm the budget. Bethany. Yeah, hi. You want me to go ahead? Go for it. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, so I'm the budget director here at CDOT, um, so my team uh, works to put together the um, budget allocation plan every year. So um, we've been working on FY24 over the past many months, and we're kind of now at that point where we've got the budget built and wanted to bring it to you all for review and feedback to the Transportation Commission um, in preparation for uh, the March Commission meeting when the FY24 final annual budget will be presented to them for adoption. Um, we will, after we uh, go to the commission in March and get um, the review and adoption, we will um, then be able to uh, present the budget April 15th to the governor's office and the legislature. So that's where we're at with kind of building and finalizing the FY24 budget. So just wanted to share um, kind of all the information and everything that went into it and present it to you. So. Um, next slide. Okay, so as far as agenda, uh, I'll briefly go over the sources and uses of revenue um, at a high level. I'll discuss the revenue allocation plan, cover the major changes in the budget, um, including the faster safety program, what revenues we were able to allocate um, to the 10 year plan in, in FY24, changes to MLOS and then some adjustments that we made in the agency operations line. And then lastly, we'll take a look at the decision items and then talk about timeline and next steps. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so this is an overview of our primary sources of revenue. Um, the largest source being federal programs that represents about 46% of our funding. Um, our federal funds are followed up by our um, highway user tax fund, about 588 million, about 33% of our budget. And then um, the next biggest piece is Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise, which is a pretty significant portion, 153 million or almost 9% of our budget. And then we have um, kind of all these other various sources that round out the entire 1.8 billion, um, including the enterprises and aeronautics and some miscellaneous uh, revenue. Uh, next slide. On the uses side, uh, the bulk of our revenue is allocated to capital construction, 733 million, about 41% of our budget, nearly 26% is dedicated to maintenance and operations. And then 18%, about 318 million is going to sub-allocated programs, um, which are those dollars that pass through to local agencies. 
and the remaining programs bring that total allocation to 1.8 billion. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, this is a look at kind of all of the products in the budget. So uh, the entire annual budget has many parts and pieces. They're all posted online. If you Google CDOT budget, you should be able to find your way there. We, um, we prepare a full narrative. This is, I think it's about 96 pages long. It's got kind of all the details of our budget in depth. Um, great for answering questions. And there are a lot of tables in there. Um, in these appendices that are listed here. So open projects and unexpended project balances, planned projects, our total construction budget, um, if you're interested in indirect costs and construction engineering, and then there's also a full personnel report in there. So um, you can see the link, link there. Um, it's all online if you wanna go take a look at any, any details. So um, next slide. Okay, the, the major product that um, is of, of great interest within the budget is Appendix A, the Revenue Allocation Plan. So this is where we take all of the revenue projected for the fiscal year and allocate it to programs. Uh, we built the plan using our September 2022 revenue forecast. We um, revise and come out with a new forecast every quarter. Um, we did do a forecast in December, but there weren't any changes significant enough to warrant starting from the beginning and rebuilding the budget over again. So uh, we just decided to stick with using that September forecast. So our typical process when we start building the budget is to um, first take flexible revenue, allocate it based on where we, where we had our FY23 budget amounts, which were adopted by the commission back in March of 2022. Um, we do have to make some adjustments to balance. And then in flexible revenues, we automatically adjust based on the forecast because they have to go um, where that program is. And then asset management and maintenance programs, we fund according to the FY24 asset management planning totals, which were approved by the commission in November of 2019. Um, and then here at the bottom of the slide, we just kind of provide a recap of that, um, the 1.8 billion and, and how it lays out between CDOT and the, the now four different enterprises that we have. Next slide. Appendix B, the spending plan, is another piece of information that really helps give a more complete picture of the budget. Um, we often focus on the revenue allocation plan which gives you a breakdown of how we're allocating one year of revenue. And that's really where the decision-making comes into play around how you want to plan for your dollars, how you want to allocate your new resources. So it makes sense that we focus there, but the spending plan is another important component. Um, it's an estimate of what dollars we think will actually go out the door this upcoming year. So when it comes to the operations side of CDOT or what we call cost centers, those funds largely spend within that same fiscal year. These are things like payroll, operating expenses, maintenance and operations, and so forth. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Of course, where things get more complex is when we start to look at the capital side of our budget or the project expenditures. Typically, we don't spend project funds in the same year that we allocate the revenue. Uh, for the majority of projects, those funds spend in the next summer or the summer after. Some large projects can take multiple years to complete. Um, in general, the bulk of our expenditures lag about one year. Uh, but the point being, when you're thinking about how our budget works, it's important to understand that dollars that are going out the door in a fiscal year are typically revenue that was allocated in prior years. Um, so anyway, we've done our best to try and estimate, given all of those past years of budget, all the projects in motion, where they're at and so forth, what we think we'll be spending in fiscal year 24. And that's what's included in Appendix B in the budget allocation plan. So we're forecasting that we will see just about 2.5 billion go out the door in expenditures next year, 2.2 billion on the CDOT side and about 290 million between Virgin Tunnel Enterprise and CTIO. Mm -hmm. The bulk of those expenditures are of course capital construction. We're estimating those expenditures to exceed 1.2 billion, including uh, nearly 850 million in contractor payments. So, um, now, as you might recall, since our total revenues in FY24 are estimated at 1.8 billion, you can see that we're gonna be making significant progress in reducing our rather large fund balance, um, which, we're, which we have as a result of both Senate Bill 267 um, and some recent stim one-time stimulus money. So uh, we expect expenditures to exceed new revenue by about 700 million. 
in uh, fiscal year 24. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, just switching gears here a little bit to talk about some of the details within that revenue allocation plan. Um, so sh shifting back to think about uh, one year's worth of revenue and where, where we're programming it, like what programs we're putting it to. So one, one item that we needed to kind of um, address was FASTER, the FASTER program. Uh, Senate Bill 260 and House Bill 1351 temporarily reduced the road safety surcharge fee for two years. Um, and that um, left us with a shortfall of about $20 million in FY24. Um, House Bill 1351 provided a partial backfill, so $47.1 million. And that was given to us in a one-time lump sum in FY23. Um, we'll roll forward $10.2 million of that, which is intended to partially backfill faster revenue for FY24. So we have a piece of the backfill, but we do want to keep that program whole. So we have decided to add an additional 9.7 million in state funds to um, continue a full allocation of 69.2 million. So the faster safety program has, has kind of, um, for many years, the past few years, been at 69.2 million. And so we didn't, we didn't wanna see that baseline kind of get eroded. So we went ahead um, and allocated an additional 9.7 million in state funds to, to keep that program whole in FY24. Next slide. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, revenue we're able to allocate to the 10-year plan. <coughs> we're at 123.2 million. We have 10% of that allocated to the multimodal line, at 12.3 million. Um, so, of course, although the average planning number over the course of four years was about $325 million a year, um, the revenue allocations over that time span will have a lot of variability because we're managing a multi-year program. So, FY24 has a little bit lower allocation in comparison to that planning figure because we have a lot of upfront one-time revenues that are uh, currently in our fund balance that we're spending down. So to Senate Bill 267, Senate Bill 260, stimulus funds. Um, but I did wanna kind of highlight, so we, we were able to um, allocate 123.2 million um, in FY24. Um, next slide. Um, okay, a little bit about the maintenance budget. So the FY24 starting budget for maintenance level of service program is 274.9 million. Or um, that in, so that includes 259 million that was approved as the asset management planning budget by the commission um, back in 2019, plus 5.9 million that was approved beginning in the FY23 budget to address salary increases for TM1 and the maintenance employee portion of across the board salary inc increases in FY23. For the final FY24 budget, um, we decided to allocate an additional 5.2 million to fully fund the maintenance employee portion of the 5% across the board salary increases that were requested in the governor's FY24 budget. Um, and then 4.8 million for a housing stipend program, um, which we had discussed with the commission um, back in July. Um, and that brings our final allocation to 284.9 million for MLOS and FY24. Um, next slide. Okay, um, agency operations. So the allocation for agency operations was increased by 6.5 million um, to address increases in statewide common policies, um, including that 5% across the board salary increase um, in kind of all the other that department for staff are, and several initiatives that were previously approved by um, either executive management or the commission, but had not yet been incorporated into the budget, um, such as our regularly scheduled PC rollout for 24 and the high school apprenticeship program and things like that. So this is just a listing of kind of the different pieces that added up to that $6.5 million. Um, next slide. So those were kind of the, the big components um, of uh, uh, where, where we kind of had unique allocations in the budget. Um, 
We do, um, during the FY24 budget building process, CDOT divisions and regions request decision items. So, um, you know, they can come forward with requests for funding that represent a significant change to their current program. So if there's a new or expanded program or a new investment um, that they're, they're looking at doing in FY24, um, we have an internal process. They'll bring that forward um, and then we'll take a look at that and, and, and process that. So in accordance with policy directive 703, decision item requests of less than a million dollars are reviewed and subject to approval by executive management, while decision items of a million or greater are reviewed um, by executive management and then forwarded to the commission uh, for consideration. So um, for FY24, there are no decision items that were approved by the EMT that require um, additional approval by the commission. Um, but there was one kind of notable decision item that um, we wanted to include for informational purposes. The traffic safety um, in the Division of Engineering asked to increase its indirect budget by 500,000 to support ongoing collection and coding of crash data that's used by engineering for analysis and reporting. So um, those funds will be used for contract staff that will add critical elements to the crash database that are not currently available for each, each of the records received like highway, mile point, geographical coordinates, region, things like that. So this was approved as a one-time decision item in the FY23 budget but now has been approved as an ongoing allegation, allocation in the traffic safety indirect budget. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, okay, so that brings me to timeline and next steps. Um, you know, we're, we're going to um, add one more piece to the budget, which is to estimate roll forward. Uh, we, we tend not to do that any earlier in the process because it's just, it's too difficult. It's a lot easier when we get to this point in the fiscal year to be able to kind of project starting July 1, what, what dollars we think we're gonna roll forward into the next fiscal year. So, um, you know, we're working on incorporating those, those estimates into the revenue allocation plan just for reporting purposes, so for transparency and visibility. Um, and then uh, the Transportation Commission, uh, when they meet in March here in a few, few weeks, will be asked to review and adopt the FY24 budget. Um, and then we will go ahead and submit that final plan to the governor's office and the legislature. So today I just wanted to kind of bring this to you um, and present it um, for your kind of uh, review and recommendation uh, to the commission. And that's all I have. Okay, questions? So the com commission had some concerns at their last meeting in terms of um, uh, snow, ice and snow. Do you have any comment? Have you made any changes or anything for the budget for that? Um, yeah, you know, as I recall that discussion, I think um, we, you know, we have uh, 10 million in contingency set aside. And if I recall, and maybe John can help me out, we were, we were at about Seven million through that ten million contingency. Um, so I think um, you know we were we, we're at the point of kind of keeping a close eye on everything, um, and we can make decisions as we as we need to. Uh, but at this time, um, seven and a half million. Thanks, John. Um, you know, at this time, um, we do, we do have um, you know further contingency reserve accounts that we could um, have the commission call upon if if needed. So. Um, so I think, um, we haven't taken action right now, but we, we can do that if, if needed. Other questions? Okay, so is there a motion to recommend approval to the commission for the 23-24 annual budget? Uh, Commissioner Williams, so moved. Is there a second? Commissioner Ross, second. Thank you. Further discussion?
Hearing none, is there anybody that disagrees with recommending the approval of the 23-24 annual budget to the commission? Hearing none, we'll approve the, the we'll consider it approved to recommend the approval of this budget to the commission who will uh, move it forward to the governor okay infrastructure fiber and broadband do you want me to share my screen for the presentation or yes well Unless you have somebody else doing it. I oh. it for you, Allie. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Uh, by the way, good presentation last time. Um, yeah, maybe lower expectations a little bit. Hopefully this is a, this is a good presentation too. Um, thank you all for having me. I've never been to the stack before, so I'm excited to be here and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I also just wanna say, this is kind of a reiteration of the, the presentation I gave in February to the Transportation Commission, but uh, the agenda slot is a little bit shorter for this meeting. So I cut some content and I'm gonna try and talk relatively fast to get through it with respect to the agenda. So um, I, I appreciate the opportunity. So I'm Allie Axley, I'm the ITS branch manager. And if you could go to the next slide, please. I am going to talk to you guys today about just an overview of what the ITS branch is, because I think it gives important context to where the fiber program lives at CDOT, context I always find to be very helpful. Um, then I'm going to dive deeper into the background of the fiber program, how it came to be, how we got to where we are today, and then I want to talk about what we are currently active, acting on in our branch right now today, um, very consumed by the fiber topic right now, and um, we'll wrap up with talking about where we're trying to get to with the, the fiber program. So next slide, please. So for those of you who may not know, the Intelligent Transportation Systems Branch, ITS branch, sits within the Division of Maintenance and Operations. We're under the operations side of that umbrella. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't know if this is slide or not, but um, what is ITS? The ITS branch is entirely responsible for the technology on our roadways, the systems that allow us to gather data, view and monitor our highways, collect weather information, uh, control variable speed limit signs, variable speed limit messaging signs. And so what this slide is meant to depict to all of you is that that one camera in the top left corner on that pole requires infrastructure all across the state in order for it to communicate back and display on an operation center's uh, video wall, like you see in the bottom there, that's a uh, EGMT uh, uh, video wall. So our branch is entire, entirely responsible for all of these components that make that one camera work, the camera, the pole, the cabinet. There's a switch in that cabinet that connects to our fiber infrastructure. Our fiber travels through conduit and pole boxes and manholes, is spliced at multiple locations and aggregated in larger switches at node buildings so that it can be backhauled to these facilities and used by our customers. So we have tons of customers who are very interested in this technology that uh, vary distinctly, but I'll, I'll just highlight two examples of that. One would be our operation centers. They are not part of the ITS branch, but they're some of our primary customers who leverage our cameras and this data to monitor and manage our highway system. Um, on the left there, that's the tool, the application they use to post messages and control the cameras. Um, called OpenTMS. And on the right, it is, it's heavily connected to our CoTrip website. So if you would click the button on the slide deck, please. Um, CoTrip is one of uh, the nation's DOT websites that is, that is very heavily used. In the month of December alone, our CoTrip website had 27 million views, and it was, all, it was close to a million unique viewers. So those are our public customers who are consuming all this information that relies on this infrastructure today. Next slide, please. Um, so another way to think about that is it's kind of linear, maybe engineering brain a little bit, but this is how I compartmentalize all those components that we're responsible for and kind of those primary assets that we need to make our system work. So if you uh, would click the next slide, please. So everything that now has an orange uh, uh, outline around it, those are all the components, again, that just enable that one camera to work back on those applications that our operators use that post to CoTrip that enable us to leverage this technology today. So when we talk about what is ITS, ITS is truly 
It's not a device, it's a system and how that whole system works and everything it takes to make that successful. Next slide, please. So how does the branch do it? Our branch is made up of uh, 39 full-time uh, positions and we subcontract out 20 more uh, staff augment contractors to keep our branch afloat. We currently have about 10 vacancies in our branch, but our functions are, are across the map. We have a maintenance patrol, a field operations team that is responsible for the asset management or uh, the maintenance uh, preventative and emergency repair of all of these devices, fiber infrastructure network gear across um, across the state. We also have an engineering team that design, constructs and deploys their own projects, but also acts as the SME for other region projects that incorporate technology. And then again, um, we have asset management is a, is a particular function in our branch because inventorying all of these devices and making sure we're replacement planning and allocating our budget appropriately to the best of our ability to keep everything up and running is very critical. We also have a fiber mm -hmm. development team, which currently is one person who's responsible for managing our existing agreements, working partners through new agreements and really improving our processes in that area. Um, but we also have data and reporting. So all of this information out there comes back and it needs to be consumable in some way. Um, and then in addition, we have a network and systems team that's responsible for actually lighting the network that rides our fiber infrastructure. So fiber is really just glass in the ground. It doesn't do anyone any good unless you put lasers on the end and, and turn up a network. And so we have a, a small and mighty team that does that for us across the state. Then we also have a project development team that's really um, emphasizing how we, how we uh, work technology through the systems engineering analysis, which is a critical um, and federally required process when we're deploying technology on our highways for highway operations. Um, we, we need to think through how we're investing in that technology and how we're going to make sure it's successful in the long term, how we're going to operate and maintain it, um, and not just worry about how we're going to install it um, and close the project and be done. We have to think about it in the full scale of its life cycle. Next slide, please. So again, I kind of mentioned this, but this is a kind of a ballpark. These, these numbers are getting outdated now with new projects coming on, but we have over 2,000 uh, ITS devices, those would be the, the typical ITS devices you think of, weather stations, cameras, variable message signs, um, the, the, point, the end points you see along the highway. But we also, behind all of that, we have almost 1,500 components that make up our network gear um, and our server environments. In addition, we are responsible for 18 node buildings. Um, we manage the data center out of Golden. And then we have over 1,600 miles of fiber. So again, our maintenance patrol um, has to cover border to border, corner to corner of the state, responding to issues with cameras, issues with these devices. So we do house uh, three of our maintenance patrol out of Grand Junction to help us with travel time. And we work really closely with our regions, like great collaboration with region five and, uh, and help with maintenance response for those devices that are just pretty far away from Golden. So next slide, please. Um, but of course, everyone is, is a lot more interested in fiber these days than just about anything else. So these are some um, important facts to know about our fiber. So we currently have about 1600 miles of fiber cable laid in the ground. Um, and what's, what, what gets very complicated and challenging for us to manage and maintain and inventory is if you look at that picture on the bottom left, that left that's actually a damage but it really shows all the hairs of glass that make up that fiber cable. Um, a typical fiber cable size might be 144. That means there's 144 strands in that cable. And as it travels through these different manholes and pull boxes and reaches splice points, like you see on the right, we have about 1300 locations on our network where we access the fiber. Um, it can, it can uh, connect and be spliced into other fiber cables in a variety of ways and go on a variety of paths where we try and find physical redundancy for these uh, networks that we turn up. And so tracking all of that and all of those different pathways is, is incredibly complicated and intensive for our team to keep track of. So if you would please click the button. So to give kind of scale to that is if you lined up all the fiber strands we have along the highway, we have about 135,000 fiber strand miles. So it's a uh, it's a great asset to have, and it just takes some, some resources to maintain. So if you would go to the next slide, please. So when we talk about the ITS branch and we talk about our maintenance and performance, this is a way that we look at how we kind of keep an eye um, on our successes or our challenges. So if this, these are just some example devices we have deployed. And if you just look at cameras 
All of this data is from January 2022. So for that one month of January, um, we had 740 cameras on the road out there deployed and existing. Um, and over that month of January, we had 1,700 outages or notifications or alarms that there were issues with those 740 cameras. So many of those we can clear remotely. We have a network operations center that's monitoring those alarms, checking and resetting as much as they can from the office, from a computer. Um, but then we reach a point where we really just cannot uh, successfully uh, clear the outage unless we roll a truck. So we get someone from our field operations team to go out there, respond to, replace, repair that camera. So in the month of January alone, we had a work order cost of $49,000 for the 1,700 alarms, for those 740 cameras. All in all for that month, our camera uptime was 92%. Um, we really like seeing our uptime in the 90s for sure. Our goal is certainly 100 because it's very frustrating when you need to see a part of the roadway and that one camera you need to see isn't working. Um, but then it, ju it just becomes simple math. As the number of devices go up, some of these numbers go down. And so we just look at how we can resource load to balance that. Next slide, please. So that was an overview of the ITS branch. Now I wanna dive deeper into the fiber program, which is really what everyone wants to talk about. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we are governed and we, we act on fiber legislation that enables us to be compensated for the use of the right of way. So for the value, um, for say a telecommunication provider wants to install fiber on our right of way. For coming to us and, and providing that access to the right of way, that value, these statutes really tell us that we need to be compensated in some way for having that, that partner receive that value of access to the right of way. And so an example of how that works for us is we receive an unsolicited proposal and that's defined in our statute CRS 431-1201 through 1209. Um, we receive an unsolicited proposal. It goes through uh, an oversight committee to be approved. And an example of a partnership that's recently been successful is, is Zayo came to us with an unsolicited proposal said we wanna build from Glenwood to Grand Junction. And for that access to that right of way for that value, what we'd like to give you is in-kind uh, fiber infrastructure. So conduit and cable for you to use for, for your network as well. So we act under these federal and state guidelines about how we should be compensated for the use of the, the public right of way. Um, next slide, please. But in addition, there's also internal documents to CDOT. There's several uh, TC resolutions that um, help guide us on how we should pursue this process and, uh, and what that looks like and how we have oversight committees. Um, and then in addition, that kind of clarify, we, we also have the opportunity when we have excess fiber capacity available to lease that dark fiber. And, and we, as the ITS branch, receive that, uh, that revenue from that dark fiber lease. And so this uh, TC resolution from 2010 helps dictate that we are how we use that funding and we use that funding to actually pay um, our fiber development manager salary right now. So these are examples of other documents that kind of govern how we um, have approached this program over the last two and a half decades. Uh, next slide, please. And you might have to click again. Okay, so that previous slide was meant to be a video, but I don't think it's gonna work today, but it just populated this map over time. Um, so it's really meant to show that one, it took us about two and a half decades to really get here to have this expansive 1600 mile fiber network. It didn't happen overnight, it happened because who, whoever came before us was very thoughtful and proactive about pursuing this type of network for our technology. Um, but then two, I, what I really wanna highlight is that the bulk of our mileage that we have in our fiber network was actually built, uh, built and uh, expanded because of these partnerships that we have. So because of these statutes that we have available, we were able to, to have 900 more miles of fiber network that we probably wouldn't have funded or have had the resources to deploy ourselves over the last two and a half decades. So I think that's something that's really important to highlight. This is how we kind of built out our network till today. Next slide, please. So now I wanna talk about um, what my branch and our employees are, are consumed with working on today. Um, so if you would go to the next slide, please. Number one, and kind of first and foremost, we are constantly and always consumed with maintaining our assets. So 
These are example pictures of a fiber damage we had in August, so a directional bore. Um, a directional bore went through three conduits. One of those held our fiber backbone for I-25. Another one held, uh, I believe it was Zayo's backbone. Um, and to breach that damage that you see in the top left corner, that was the directional bore that hit our conduit. Um, we, had, we had to dig a giant hole that kept filling with water and it was very challenging and cumbersome to get our fiber cable restored um, and, our, and our backbone back up and running. Uh, but luckily we had a partner on this corridor. And so a lot of the times when these partners come in and make these unsolicited proposals, they help us with our maintenance of our asset as well. So our team is on call 24 seven to, to respond to these types of events, but having partners at the ready is also incredibly helpful for us too. Next slide, please. So the next thing we're doing is we're working on leveraging our asset all over the place. Um, so this, this just is a slide that kind of walks, walks you through how many times my network and systems team has to touch the switches that our construction projects go install to make that camera work. So in order for all that communication to be successful, we need our networking team to, to, to light that up and program things in the right way and configure everything in the right way. Um, and it takes a lot of iterative points with us in projects. And again, our team is responsible kind of statewide for these assets. And so every project on the state deploying technology um, comes, comes to that one team to work through all these steps on every single device that's being deployed. So that's something that consumes our team certainly. Um, next step. We are also working on how are we expanding the assets. So this is a graphic that shows um, in blue the routes that we uh, proposed on the middle enabling middle mile grant funding. Um, we should hear if we receive that funding this month. Um, I'm anxious to hear when. Um, but we applied for this grant enabling middle mile because we understand that we we already have a 1600 mile network of fiber that's really convenient and helpful in getting communities back to Denver, which is where uh, the internet gigapoc resides. So we could truly act as a middle mile partner for a lot of communities. And if we can expand our, expand our fiber network even further, um, we could kind of further open that door to leverage our asset for these communities interested in, in broadband. So um, we'll, we'll see what we hear on that uh, grant application, hopefully in the coming weeks. Next slide, please. Another grant that uh, CDOT applied for uh, back in 2017 was the Advanced Transportation and Congestion Management Technologies Deployment Grant. This is um, for funding over Wolf Creek Pass. So Wolf Creek Pass is certainly a challenging uh, location to build fiber given its rockiness and how short the construction windows are. But I think many people are aware that that project is well underway. Um, and great success from Region 5 and the communities in supporting that uh, to get fiber in a location that is, is really tough and unlikely that industry would have come in and been interested in building themselves just because of the cost. So uh, an exciting effort and we're looking forward to targeting uh, completion on that construction this year. Next slide, please. So the next topic I wanna talk about that we're currently actively um, working on today is how we're sharing our assets. So there's three ways that we currently share our asset. The first would be a dark fiber lease. So where CDOT has excess fiber capacity available and in the ground, um, we are able to enter into agreements with uh, partners to lease that excess or dark fiber capacity. So typically we receive that request from the partner. We start talking about how many strands and what the route is that they're looking for. We provide a lease quote to make sure it's something that they're <coughs> very serious about. And we um, go field verify that we truly have capacity in that contiguous route from point A to point B, which on a new cable is really simple. You know, we, we know who's on it. There's no one yet. Um, but as you get into more densely uh, um, populated areas with fibers, such as the Denver metro area, finding that contiguous path through different splits of the fiber and how it's all spliced together in those complicated ways can be more challenging and can require us to have to do some cleanup in some of the things we find. So we always try and field verify because we certainly don't want to move forward with an agreement where we don't have all our data <clears> and we aren't sure. Um, so once we field verify, we execute an agreement that all their terms are agreed upon. And then our partners will go through our permitting process to set their pull box next to ours um, where we have an existing splice point so we can tie them all together. So that is one way um, that we can share, share our fiber with uh, communities. Uh, next slide, please. 
Another way that we're sharing our asset is our public-private partnerships. So currently, we, we recognize that this is a long and cumbersome process, uh, but we act under that statute where we receive an unsolicited proposal for access to the right-of-way. Um, we receive proposals that, that propose all kinds of things, and we certainly welcome creativity, and we are always looking for ways to get to yeses. So it can take some time to verify and approve that process through our, or and approve that proposal through our committee to make sure it's it's feasible and that it there's a win 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 for all all parties involved, um, and then we can get into agreement drafting, which is where we really nail down those business terms between us and that partner, and we review and start redlining, um, and then we get into kind of agreement execution, which is where more uh, um, reviews get involved with lawyers, the controller's office, whoever needs to whoever needs to review that agreement through our procurement processes um, to execution. And then once we execute that agreement with our partner, um, like I believe Zao is another good example on I-70, it took a couple of years to get to the point where we received their proposal and then we executed the agreement. And, uh, and then from that point, it took again, a couple of years for them to be able to go out and construct and finalize um, the implementation of what was agreed upon in that agreement. So it can take time, um, but ultimately these partnerships are, are for 20 years. So we take them very seriously and we work really hard to be good partners um, with those that come to us and, and hope for the same in return because uh, we, we will be working with these partners uh, for a very long time. Uh, next slide, please. So another way we're sharing our asset, this wouldn't be sharing our fiber structure or fiber infrastructure, but sharing access to uh, use of the right of way. So this is where a partner might be interested in building on um, our right of way, accessing our right of way, um, but they don't want to maybe install or build in kind of infrastructure to compensate the state. They'd rather pay a fee based on the, the right of way valuation. So right now this process is uh, relatively cumbersome. Again, it follows a very similar track to the previous one where it's time consuming working through um, the agreement and business terms and, and analyzing each parcel of the right of way that's across the fence on the route um, to get to the point where we're executing this agreement and allowing access to the right of way. So if you go to the next slide, please. We, we recognize that these processes are not perfect and can be cumbersome and maybe um, frustrating. And so we do have a lot of efforts in the works right now to process improve. So one thing um, that's been a great success for us is in July, we hired our fiber development manager who maybe can come back and present to the stack again sometime. Um, but who, he's laser focused right now on improving that access to the right of way because of how cumbersome that evaluation is and proposing a fee-based structure for right of way access that is really in alignment and helps us further simplify and implement uh, what the executive order that Governor Polis put out in June related to rural broadband is, is uh, telling CDOT to do. So um, Jonas is going to be presenting at the TC in March on this fee-based structure. And uh, so there's more to come there, but we're making progress. We're also working really hard on improving our communication and making sure our fiber website is staying up to date, providing clear expectations for what the process looks like. We're going to continue to look at that and try and simplify everywhere we can. Um, and we also have recently formed uh, an executive steering committee to help us focus and prioritize on kind of all the requests and all the areas we can improve because we certainly want to improve everywhere, but, but we'll be more successful if we focus on the top priorities and, and get to the rest as we can. Um, Next slide, please. And one thing that's critical for our success in doing all of that is our collaboration. So we are meeting um, regularly with our internal stakeholders. We work very closely with our permit offices, our utility engineers, our traffic engineers, um, our right of our right of way groups. I mean, I mean, many stakeholders are helping us get to some of these answers because certainly ITS is not a subject matter expert in all of those areas, and so. Um, we really appreciate the internal collaboration we've had. We've also been collaborating very heavily with the Colorado Broadband Office, given broadband initiatives and the fiber asset, it only makes sense that we're working really closely together and we're, we're hoping to further define our roles and responsibilities, make that really clear and as successful as, as we can be as a state. Um, but we are also working with our new partners all the time. So we, we meet at least weekly with our new requests from public partnerships to try and make them move forward successfully, but we're also trying to listen to industry and work collaboratively with all the grant funding coming out to encourage industry to, to fill some of the gaps that are out there with our, our rural broadband connection, connections, excuse me. Um, next slide, please. 
So, oh man, sorry. <clears throat> so where are we going? At the end of the day, we recognize that um, we have two assets that are super critical to a lot of these conversations, our dark fiber and our right of way. And we're looking at what each of those processes look like to, to enable access to those by, by interested parties and trying to find ways that we can simplify, reduce the steps and the hurdles to get to implementation. Um, and really at the end of the day, we wanna increase the timeliness of the access to these assets because um, there's a lot moving now and timing is just something that is a challenge for many, but we can work better at being faster um, and we also really are focused on kind of our customer service and our communication. The, the better we can inform and prepare folks um, to step through these processes, we know everyone will be more successful in that way. So we're trying very hard to stay very focused on our customer service and improving these processes for all. Uh, next slide, please. So that was my condensed version of the TC presentation uh, I gave in February. And again, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. So Allie, they might not might know what the cost is on some of this stuff. So as an example, the repair that you had a slide of, the one that was a deep hole, how much yeah. did that cost? Um, I will tell you, I don't know that full number offhand because the partner um, on that corridor came to help us do the repair. They are the one that's pulling together all the costs and working with their insurance and their their risk management, their version of risk management to go after the the party that damaged that fiber. So I don't I don't know the exact number on that one, but I can tell you um, they range depending on how complicated they are. They can be from a hundred thousand dollars to a quarter of a million dollars very easily and very quickly depending on what it looks like. And part of part of the reason is because it can get very um, challenging when fiber gets damaged in a location we weren't prepared for to introduce maybe a new splice, maybe we just, okay, the fibers damaged, we'll take the endpoint, the endpoint, and we'll, we'll introduce what's called a butt splice, which is an end of a cable to an end of a cable. If we don't have enough length in that cable to make that connection and pull both ends into a splice truck to actually do that work, we may have to re-pull a new cable through that route in order to have that ability. And so, it really, what's challenging about all of those damages is they are so variable and it really depends when you get out there on, on seeing what you see and making the, the right call to, to restore in the most productive way possible. That was not a direct answer, but I don't know the direct number no. on that whole <laughs> damage. I, I know that uh, you mentioned to the commission that the cost of that particular one, because it was so deep, was $2 million. Um, I, I think that uh, I can I can look into the number and get it to you. I'm so sorry. That's <laughs> yeah, that, the exact number isn't important. The idea is it's very, very expensive when mistakes happen. Very much so. And the so question, and that's, yeah. Questions. Okay, Ron. Hey, Ali, thanks very much for the presentation. Really, really great. It, the, the fiber network is obviously a huge asset for our collective transportation system. Does, does your access policy and fee structure and sort of public partnership policies differentiate between shared transportation purposes for use of the fiber network versus sort of non-transportation purposes? I will say we always try. So part of the statute that we operate under is, is about how you evaluate those unsolicited proposals. And it talks about how does this proposal contribute to the department's mission? So obviously, as the Department of Transportation, we, uh, we, we would like to see some value brought to our transportation network in some way, improving safety or operations of the highway. But I think that the conversations happening now are, are really important about how rural broadband can enable maybe less commuters, can encourage uh, or help contribute to the greenhouse gas initiatives. And so I, I think that conversation is, is still happening. So I, I don't want to say anything super definitive there, but um, we always try and be as, as creative as we can because we recognize wins can look a lot of different ways in, in coming to these partnerships. Yeah, I, just a just quick follow up. I, th I think you know it it makes sense to 
um, have a really robust uh, um, kind of program and policy to to manage the fiber network for sort of uses that are with private partners for kind of private profit, right? You've made a we've made we've collectively have made a public investment in an in infrastructure asset and sort of private private users for private profit ought to uh, contribute to those costs and reimburse the public for those costs. When we're talking about a transportation asset like the fiber network that connects multiple transportation systems and for ITS purposes and signal inter interconnects, maybe maybe we ought to think about sort of a different structure um, for uses by public agencies um, for that contribute to our collective sort of management of the transportation system and ITS. And I think the kind of the kind of fee structure that CDOT has proposed may be a real obstacle um, for that. And the policy of sort of a 30 mile minimum length doesn't necessarily apply to sort of a local jurisdiction that needs access to a relatively smaller piece of the fiber network in order to sort of interconnect multiple signal systems, including CDOT signal systems, when we have a regional approach like we do in the Denver region. I, I definitely hear you. I don't have a direct answer. I will I will say one thing that makes our fiber network very unique compared to industry is how often we we access it. I mean, 1300 splice points is is not typical for some of the providers that are on our right of way because we we do have that demand and, and the frequency of our, our technology assets. So it is something unique and it does kind of change the way we have to look at managing and introducing additional splice points because we, we have to think um, through how realistically we can degrade the network and still have communication on the full path because every splice point is an opportunity to lose light it, it we just have a different um challenge and and how and how we're leveraging the network definitely yeah no 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 doubt and i think part from our perspective i mean when when the denver region through its tip has invested you know upwards of around seven million dollars over the years to help cdot's cdot build its fiber network in the denver region um, kind of charging our local government members for access to that fiber network for transportation purposes seems a little counterproductive to us. So I think I think we would just like to have some additional conversations with you and the team there about how we think about the system um, in the Denver region where we have multiple kind of traffic systems operating that um, where we have a regional strategy and, and have appreciated your participation in those past discussions about how we cooperatively and sort of co in a coordinated way manage that whole system in the region. Definitely interested in having more conversations. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, that's two excellent presentations that I've seen. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is uh, Region 5 is going to give us an information update. Good morning, Stack. I'm Julie Constant. I'm the Region 5 Thank Transit you, Director. Um, so it, there was some discussion amongst um, a number of upper echelons, actually the executive management within the organization of CDOT to start having some highlights of some of the things that we have going on around the regions in the state, uh, just because not all stack really engaged um, with other regions uh, from that perspective. So region five is gonna go first and region five is in Southwest, South Central Colorado. We have 15 counties that we oversee the highways uh, within. Our very Northwestern border is uh, the Western half of Montrose okay. County. And then we go down to the Four Corners across Wolf Creek Pass and up into Chafee County through the San Luis Valley. So we have a pretty diverse region. We are the least populated region within the state and we don't have any interstates, which some days is a great thing, but when it comes to funding, it definitely impacts our funding and we're the lowest funded region in the state. So we're constantly trying to figure out how to creatively fund projects, which that brings in our partnerships with our locals. We really rely upon all those partnerships with our locals and our TPR reps to try and team up as much as we can on these projects and keep funding flowing into this part of the state. Um, and then one other thing to note, we do have 13 mountain passes over 18 or over 8,000 feet within our region, Wolf Creek Pass, Red Mountain Pass being some of our more infamous passes along with Levita Pass. Um, so today, David Valentinelli, who's our project director, 
uh, for our major project that we have done in the region. It's the largest project Region 5 has ever seen. Is going to give you guys a presentation and an update, as well as Tony Katie, our Region Environmental Program Manager, I think will kick in too. So I will pause there and hand it to David. Just make sure I can figure out how to unmute. Um, hopefully you guys are seeing the uh, presentation. We are and we can hear you too, David. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, good, good morning. Um, let me reduce this, sorry. Uh, my name is David Valentinelli. Uh, I am the resident engineer in CDOT's Region 5 and also serve as the project director on the US 550 uh, Connection to 160 Design Build Project, as, as Julie just said. Um, I wanted to give you uh, the opportunity, or thank you for this opportunity to provide a brief overview and update on this critically important and regionally significant project. Um, this slide provides a little background on the critical milestones achieved prior to the start of construction. I'm going to primarily focus on, on the more recent history, 2017 through today, uh, but you can kind of see that this project is a long time in the making. Um, after the completion and supplementation of the environmental documents on the US 550 and 160 corridors, CDOT began to actively pursue grant opportunities for this TPR project, priority project. Uh, luckily, in 2017, CDOT worked with La Plata County to submit and receive Fast Lanes grants from the USDOT. Additionally, we developed financial partnerships with the Southern Ute Indian Tribe, the City of Durango, and La Plata County. With the support of the Transportation Commission, we were able to fully fund this project for construction. This same partnership supported a successful DOLA grant about a year later. Uh, we finalized the design build selection process in late 2019. Uh, and selected Lawrence Construction with RSNH as the design build contractor team. Uh, again, as you can see, this, this project was a long time in the making, and we can hope to continue this theme uh, as we continue to develop both the US 550 and 160 corridors as funding becomes available to the region. This slide provides details on the overall project values and goals that were established at the beginning of the design build process. The project values show here that we are believed to be unique to the design build process, which typically only presents goals. Uh, we sought to include these values of the project to reinforce the environmental documents purpose and need. We broke these out separately from the goals as we did not want to lose sight of the purpose and need, but these items didn't translate very well to scorable goals. Uh, that ultimately was the basis of selecting the, the successful proposer. Uh, to touch on a few of the goals, maximize, maximize scope was our primary objective. Uh, being the largest project in the region uh, we've ever been part of, we wanted to do as much as we could with the budget. So we really wanted to show what we were capable of uh, and challenge proposers to give us as much as we could for, for the value, the, the guaranteed maximum price that we, we provided them. Um, with, it, with the reference designs, 2.2 million, 2.2 million cubic yards of excavation, just kind of stress that a little bit. It's a, it's a lot of uh, earthwork. Uh, we knew excavation would be a key component and to the project, both in terms of the cost um, and in terms of the impact of the uh, public. Uh, at the time, we also saw that maybe the material had a potential revenue that could be turned back into the project uh, in, the, in the form of scope or that the material could be staged uh, efficiently for future use. Uh, in the end, we left it open. Uh, we challenged them to uh, that integrated approach to the earthwork. Um, it turns out most of the disposal sites wanted to be paid for the material, whether it was good or bad. So uh, our, our hopes were, were somewhat dashed in that regard. Uh, corridor aesthetics is also something uh, that we valued and not something that you often see as a focus on a highway project, although I think it's becoming more and more and more relevant. Um, in our beautiful part of the state, we had aesthetic commitments with the environmental document uh, that we needed to uphold, but we also wanted to be respectful of our environment and not uh, and the potential impact uh, that the project had on it. Um, it is not often that, that a project of this type or size comes to our region. Um, as we've alluded to. In fact, this project will be the first traditional design build or is the first traditional design build in the region at a size of two times our typical annual program. Um, to the region's credit, has worked with leveraging partnerships uh, and grants to bring attention to this need and um, I guess not to mention a, a bunch of uh, effort to make it happen. So appreciate everyone that was involved and came together on this. 
Um, the project limits focus on, focus on two distinct uh, corridor segments from US 160 to County Road 302, was, which was an existing uh, developed intersection. Um, there's the, the basic configuration, which I'll touch on later, which is part of the EIS uh, component of the project, goes from the connection of the Grandview Interchange um, to just south of County Road 220. And then, and that's about a mile and a half, and then three additional miles from that just south of County Road 220 uh, to the connection of the 302. Um, Part of the, and, and just kind of this will we'll touch base on these basic configuration and uh, additionally requested elements in a minute. Um, part of the safety values uh, designated in the environmental documents was to eliminate the signalized intersection at the bottom of Farmington Hill, um, which, which is a steep, shaded, potentially icy and windy approach. The new alignment uh, takes the six to 8% grade of the current route um, to a three to four and a half percent climb with widened shoulders that meets current standards. The basic configuration key components was uh, as kind of highlighted from the other slide to uh, to realign the, the interchange so to remove the, the 550 traffic off the, the steep windy 550 uh, Farmington Hill grade, um, create a four lane facility uh, although a, a climbing lane was was committed to and as the fast lane, so we we upped the ante and added a, a both both directions, uh, two lanes each direction, uh, to improve the intersections, uh, which was part of the fast lane grants as well as the DOLA commitment, um, and then just highlighting that maximizing uh, mobility, safety, and efficiency. We've got a, a, a host of wildlife vehicle collision mitigations. Um, and that's, it comes in the form of wildlife underpass, deer jump outs, um, and small mammal crossings. And then at the end, we would reclaim the old alignment um, as we, we switch traffic over. So again, we're, we're focusing on safety improvements, wildlife mitigation, access management, um, and improved safety and mobility. And that's, uh, that is our basic configuration. And again, that's about a mile and a half. The additionally requested elements, um, are something that's unique to the design and build uh, process. Uh, it's a, a challenge to the proposers to see what they can deliver beyond uh, the basic configuration. Um, and the project includes two uh, additionally requested elements. One focus on wildlife vehicle collision mitigation, which would help address this uh, single largest accident type in the corridor. And one focus on maximizing the total length of the improvement. So we're trying to find that balance of that safety and the mobility as we challenge the proposers to bring more to the table for our upset amount or a guaranteed maximum price. In the end, the successful proposer was able to give all of the additionally requested elements. So that was three additional miles uh, beyond the basic configuration. So the, and the basic configuration in a word is the minimum that we, we expected for the, the upset amount or the guaranteed maximum price. Now I'm looking at the connection to the Grandview interchange. Uh, this is the existing structure over here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, the reference design included a, a fairly large inscribed diameter roundabout circle, um, resulting in a large cut. The, the proposer, one of the innovations that were, were brought to the table uh, was this more efficient uh, roundabout design focusing on the, the primary legs of, of the flow north-south. Um, and while accounting for the ramp the within the interchange, um, this reduced the cut, the amount of cut um, and amount and the amount of impact to the the environment. Um, and this, in turn, they turned into additional scope. Um, just again, another just general picture of the uh, the project. Uh, this barrier separated uh, highway section was developed in the, in the reference design uh, and taken forward with by the proposer. Um, this limited the amount of cut that we had to do as we were climbing out of the, um, the valley, so to speak, uh, and that one of the mechanisms to reduce the amount of cuts that we had. Uh, so keeping, keeping the section tighter up top as we climbed out of, of uh, climbed up to the top of the mesa. And then once we were on top of the mesa, we opened up the section to help facilitate uh, intersections, U-turn movements, and, and the like. 
Um, just highlighting some of the benefits of the design build that we saw from, from this project, the innovation that, that the contractor team brought to the table um, was a, uh, a reduction of the excavation quantity by 1 million cubic yards, uh, fairly substantial. And that resulted in eight and a half acres less of disturbance. Um, they committed to effectively use the excavated material to build the roadway section. So uh, that the good material that we had, uh, which is uh, there's a, a gravel pit across the way, as you can see that there is a beneficial use to the material uh, was then turned to, to create the roadway. Um, so we're, we don't have to, there's not a lot of waste and, and we, we benefit from the quality of material. Um, and interestingly enough, within this process, the, the proposer committed to increase both the height and the length of both bridges, uh, not something that we saw as, as a, a viable option when we were, we were going through the, the initial process. Um, so they, just showing the benefits of, of the, the competition, they saw that the increased structure size and increased structure uh, offset the, the cost of, of the excavation. Um, the end date, uh, so just looking at the schedule, as we, we touched on earlier, uh, the selection was December of 2019. Um, the end dates have been adjusted to accommodate some of the project needs and issues. Um, the existing bridge approach settlements mitigation uh, that will require maybe further ad ad adaption to adaptation, excuse me, to this uh, completion date. Uh, but here again, we're, we're, we're progressing uh, the project and adapting to some of the challenges. And a project of this size uh, over this length of time is sure to have some challenges. Yeah, and as any construction project would face, you know, innumerable challenges and issues, design build projects are no different. Uh, but the design build process serves to allocate the, the risk of some of these challenges to either CDOT as the owner or the contractor or both. Um, this slide provides a list of some of the more onerous issues and risks uh, that have, we have needed to address during the life of this project. However, I just wanted to focus on a couple just to, for time's sake. Um, one, one of the big challenges was working with the irrigation company. Uh, this project impacted uh, an irrigation ditch. So we had to develop our design, work with the ditch company to alter their system to align with our, our new, um, new re newly reconstructed uh, project. Um, right away, uh, we acquired much of the right of way up front, but not knowing how far the project would go, we still had some right of way acquisition that we did as we were developing the design. Uh, these later acquisitions uh, sometimes resulted in conditions that needed to be applied to the contract as, as change orders. Staffing, um, a project to this duration and uh, length, uh, unfortunately, results in uh, I guess anticipated, although unwelcome staff turnover. Um, that st staff turnover uh, reduces some of our historic knowledge and consistency. Um, for my project team alone, we had three members uh, promote out of this project. So I think that's a testament to the quality of staff that we, we need and we had on this project and perhaps uh, the experience of the project that gained them uh, to make those promotional opportunities. Um, Design, uh, in some ways, there's a, 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 I'll call it a loss of control as the technical criteria controls the design. Uh, so not loss in terms of if they can do whatever they want, the technical criteria controls um, as the rules uh, allow um, in the competition of the process. Uh, but despite, despite this risk, uh, project first team approach and side-by-side -side task forces can bring mutually beneficial solutions to the project. Um, and the final challenge that I, I really want to highlight on is, is the archaeology. Uh, this is one of the more, most interesting and challenging aspects of this project. Uh, involves CDOT environmental commitment to conduct archaeological mitigation and compliance with the conditions outlined in the environmental impact statement. Uh, the result of these commitments was the single largest archaeological investigation and excavation in CDOT history. Um, so pretty, I mean, this, this picture alone, and I'll highlight this again, uh, the quality of the artifacts and just the size of, of the findings is, is pretty impressive. Um, during the environmental review, the project was found to contain all or parts of seven ancestral Puebloan arch 
archaeological sites. Uh, large excavations were conducted on the sites in 2018 and 2019 to mitigate the adverse effects of the proposed construction beginning in 2020. Uh, three of the sites were found to contain substantial significant remains, including 12 pit houses, uh, surface room blocks, tens of thousands of stone and ceramic artifacts, four generally intact human uh, burials, uh, and many scattered human ske skeletal remains. Uh, with the challenges uh, come the opportunity to shine, this mitigation committed commitment allowed us to work closely with Native American youth and elders as well as closely interact with several tribes. We were able to convey, can, excuse me, gain the investment, invested interest in the project from two tribes and to produce a, document, a documentary uh, that included important tribal perspectives. Uh, and that's currently being aired on Rocky Mountain PBS uh, and YouTube. Uh, in addition to the document, document, documentary, excuse me, I can't speak, uh, a report has been drafted and we will continue to work closely uh, to appropriately and respectfully find resting places for the findings, including the repatriation of the human remains. Um, just a few more photos, again, noting the size of the dwellings in the photos, as well as the quality of the artifacts that were find, found. Um, not ignoring the sensitivity of the disturbance, uh, I, I feel that this ex careful excavation helps save items uh, that may not have otherwise been lost, that may have otherwise been lost under different circumstances. So um, there are things that maybe had the project, uh, highway project not gone through under the controls that we have in place to protect our environment um, and, and our, our resources such as these, uh, they may have just been um, bulldozed uh, in a word. Uh, acknowledging some of the challenges and success that they, that they bring, the project is working towards a 2023 completion. Um, just kind of a few remaining pictures in my presentation. This is a picture before we started, uh, just to highlight the, the existing wall in this large cut. Uh, we are bridging to the future in this project. And this the snow, unfortunately, takes a little bit of way of it, but you can picture that the wall was here, much bigger, and that you can the cut, this is the cut slope currently. So just kind of flip back and forth. Um, just to get a perspective of the amount of material that, that's being moved to make this connection. We have to go from this grade, this elevation, up to this elevation, but uh, over a mile and a half. Um, another perspective of the Grandview interchange, again, Grandview Bridge, uh, over 160 in the foreground. Uh, the roundabout would be just beyond uh, within this cut. Um, another aspect uh, facing east of the Grandview Interchange, uh, this is Ramp A, Grandview Interchange. This is Gulch B Bridge, which is 250 feet long and 65 feet in the air, uh, but you can get a, a feel for this uh, grade that we're achieving. And here's a, maybe a better perspective of the cut that we had to, uh, to create to, to make this happen. Uh, here's a picture of the Gulch A bridge. This is one that they, they made both longer and taller. Uh, but this one is 600, uh, excuse me, 565 feet long and about 150 feet at the highest point. Um, so they, they raised the grade, lengthened the structure uh, to achieve the top of the Mesa. Uh, again, US 160 is in the foreground as they're coming around and going over the top of 160. Uh, large, we had two large mammal underpasses. There's an atrium in the middle to provide additional lighting for, for the wildlife. Um, so there's two large mammal crossings uh, on this in addition to the two large structures that serve as, as large mammal crossings and then a host of small mammal crossings uh, throughout. And here's another uh, aspect. Uh, this is we're going from a two lane facility to a four lane facility. Uh, to the right of the picture, this is approximately the old alignment. Uh, traffic ran un fairly unimpeded on the old alignment while we created the, the northbound lanes. Uh, traffic has now been switched to the northbound lanes or two directions currently here while they construct the southbound lane. Um, a, a fairly efficient construction, letting the contractor do what they need and letting the traffic do what they need as well. Uh, with that, does anyone have any questions that I can try to answer? Any questions?
I do appreciate your time. Hopefully that was uh, beneficial. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. It was good. That's, Thanks so much. I didn't have any questions because I didn't have any questions. It was good. Interesting. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It's very kind. Thank you. All right. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the meeting, guys. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments about the meeting? Um, our next stack meeting is April 6th. Amazing, isn't it? We'll move through the year. Okay, so here's a slide of what's coming up and action items is the STIP. Program distribution starts in July and this is for the 2050 plan. And then uh, May View uh, 2023 stack work plan of anticipated gender uh, agenda topics here. Other comments? Questions? Okay. Okay, I'll consider the um, stack meeting for March 2nd adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, stay, stay safe on the road. Thank you.